isang magpagpala at mapagpalayang hapon po sa ating lahat. I hope na kayo po ay okay. Nasaan man pong bahagi ng Pilipinas kayo naroon. I believe some parts of the country right now, maulan. Uh, sana po kayanin ng inyong internet connection ng ating webinar ngayong hapon na to. So we are glad to welcome all of you to the second edition of our webinar, Rising to the Challenge of the Pandemic, LGU Best Practices in COVID-19 Management. This webinar is brought to you by the Center for Local and Regional Governance, or CLRG. We are a constituent unit of the University of the Philippines National College of Public Administration and Governance. We provide capacity building and extension services to local government units and other agencies on local governance matters. We have our partner for this webinar, the League of Vice Governors of the Philippines, and this is already the third webinar we are organizing together with LVGP. The first one was held last June on preparing and financing LGU COVID-19 recovery plans. And this was followed by the first edition of our LGU Best Practices webinar, which, which we held last July. So if you missed those webinars, you can check our YouTube channel and Facebook page to watch the recording. Uh, I am Michelle Castillo. Ako po isang researcher mula sa CLRG. And I will be your MC this afternoon. With me is our team from CLRG, composed of Miss Sally, Miss Becky, Miss Lou, Miss Patty, Gerard, and Mackie. So, if you have any questions or encounter any issues during this uh, webinar, you may send your concerns via chat box to any member of our CLRG team. Of course, our team is led by our director, uh, Professor Alicia Celestino. Hi, na putayong mupo. Now, let me walk you through what is going to happen in the next hours, what you should expect in our webinar this afternoon. First, uh, I will give you a quick overview of the webinar. I'll share the profile of the people joining us today, just so we can have a, a semblance of getting to know each other, although we are not in the same physical room. Then I will give the protocols, or I've already done that, the protocols in managing our activity this afternoon. Our program will begin with uh, the message from the Dean of NCPAG, Professor Dan A. Sagil, and he will be followed by uh, the Vice uh, Governor of Laguna, Kat Vice Governor Catherine Agapay, the President of our partner LVGP, who will also welcome our guests and our participants. Then we will proceed with the talks of our STEAM resource persons, and this will be followed by a reaction from Vice Governor Christine Garin of the province of Iloilo. Dr. Dixon Yasai, whom I will formally introduce later, will moderate the discussion. For our, for our open forum, we encourage you to write your questions in the chat box as we proceed with the discussion. Please include your name and the organization where you belong and to whom you are addressing the question. Our team will take note of your questions and during the open forum, um, we will try to accommodate them. We will prioritize questions sent during the registration period. And we will officially end our program with a message from the CLRG Director, uh, Professor Alicia Celestino. And we'd like to request you to stay after this for some reminders and announcements. So as I mentioned, our webinar today is already the second run of our topic. Last July, we featured the practices of Goa, Camarina Sur, Bohol, Ilocos Sur, Cagayan de Oro City, the Bupan City, and Dormok City. Today, we have the same goal of featuring interventions and innovations that have worked thus far in addressing the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic at the local level, with the hope that decision makers, practitioners, students, and practically all sorts of stakeholders will pick some approaches they can adopt and apply in your own context. So we also hope to have a good exchange of insights on the current and emerging governance issues related to COVID-19 uh, management that our featured LGUs this afternoon are experiencing and are foreseeing. Uh, so, sino-sino po ba tayo ngayon sa webinar na ito? Sa ngayon po, we have 66 uh, people inside the Zoom meeting room, but we have 175 registered participants from 45 provinces coming from different organizations. So, majority are women, and we have participants from provincial LGUs, city, municipal LGUs, the barangay councils, the SK, leagues of uh, local elective officials, and we also have participants from the House of Representatives, from different NGOs, private organizations, and from the academia. 
So, yun po, tayo pong magkakasama ngayong hapon na ito. And uh, to officially start our program and to welcome all of us to this webinar, let me now call on the Dean of UPNC PAG, Professor Dan A. Sadio, sir. Maraming maraming salamat, Michelle. Magandang hapon po sa ating lahat. Welcome to this uh, second edition of the webinar on Rising to the Challenge of the Pandemic, LGU Best Practices in COVID-19 Crisis Management. I would like to start by wishing you and your families my best for your health and safety in this time of COVID-19. I would also like to express my gratitude to the officers and members of the League of Vice Governors of the Philippines and the Director and Staff of the Center for Local and Regional Governance for hosting this event. I am very happy for the continuous hosting of this, this kind of exercise to share knowledge and experiences in managing public affairs at the local level. Sa ating mga resource person, maraming maraming salamat po sa inyong uh, pamamahagi ng inyong mga karanasan at karunungan in managing COVID-19. Webinars such as this provide us an opportunity to learn discuss thoughts, network, share ideas, create new ideas, and to ignite motivation. The benefits of joining this webinar may differ for each of us, but through this exercise, we continue to expand our professional and personal development and are provided with information that we may not be able to generate internally from within our organization, organizations. Despite improvements in the statistics in COVID-19 pandemic response, it continues its disruption of or threat to, operation, to the operations of organizations from family to businesses. Many businesses have already indicated they could not continue business operations if another round of stricter quarantine is enforced. Entrepreneurs are facing many obstacles. A crisis like this requires quick thinking in the face of uncertainty. However, with such high stakes on the line, we find ourselves dealing with analysis paralysis or the inability to make decisions due to overthinking. Delaying decisions will only lead to more problems and those problems will require more decisions. Decisions in this kind of situations are never final for the simple fact that change is never absolute. The knowledge and experiences we learn from others help us make well, help us make well informed decisions about policies, programs, and projects by putting the best available evidence. This approach stands in contrast to opinion-based policy, which relies heavily on either the selective use of evidence, like using single studies, irrespective of quality, or on the untested views of individuals or groups, often inspired by ideological standpoints, prejudices, or speculation. This disease outbreak affects girls and boys, women and men differently. Children's education was interrupted protective structures disrupted, and families and communities placed under stress by health and economic burden. There is also risk of psychological distress at times of crisis, as well as increased risk of violence, abuse, exploitation, and neglect. LGUs are very important for, e for every heterogeneous society. It brings the government nearer to the people allows for popular participation in the conduct of public affairs and acts as a two-way channel of communication between local population and the national government. As such, LGUs are well situated to respond to the impacts of COVID-19 at the community level. Fortunately for us today, we have resource speakers who have first-hand information on and experience in managing COVID-19 in their respective areas. Using what they have already learned and created can save a lot of time and resources, increase our productivity, and minimize 
increase. We have to make adjustments. We must continually motivate our constituents to keep safe and healthy by observing COVID-19 protocols. We must be abreast with COVID-19 developments, and most important, we must be effective in dealing with issues and challenges. We must improve our capability to continuously deliver quality services, and we must find ways so that there will be some degree of normalcy in our lives and livelihood. We hope that this exercise will be an effective exercise for sharing information to support and promote COVID-19 response by generating relevant and up-to-date information and sharing of experiences. I am certain that CLRG is more than willing to provide assistance to you. I sincerely hope that the lessons learned in this webinar will assist all of us as we address the COVID-19 story. Before concluding, allow me again to thank all of you for your interest in this webinar, and I trust that you would find this exercise to be a rewarding experience. Maraming salamat po at magandang hapon muli sa ating lahat. Vice Governor, the President of Ligo. Thank you, Ma'am Michelle. Before anything else, please allow me to greet our distinguished panel, starting with our able and dynamic ULA President and Quirino Governor Dax Kua, distinguished governors, Governor Kakabagao of Dinagat Islands, Late Governor Mick Petilia, to our trailblazing mayors, Mayor Benji Magalong of Baguio City, Mayor Lovell Yu of Alangalang Leyte, our very own LVGP Vice President for Visayas and Iloilo Vice Governor Tingarin, and to all our local officials, employees, and partners in the government who are present to listen and learn from the discussions, a pleasant rainy afternoon to everyone. Please allow me to thank my alma mater, the University of the Philippines, especially the National Center for Public Administration and Governance, Center for Local and Regional Governance, through Dean Dan Sagil, for partnering with the League of Vice Governors in reaching out and enabling local governments nationwide to be equipped with essential knowledge to wade successfully through this pandemic. I should say that as president of the LDGP and vice governor of Laguna, we started 2020 with a lot of hope and plans. But as a matter of necessity, we had to quickly change gears as early as the first quarter to adopt and survive the COVID-19 pandemic. We have never experienced a crisis of this magnitude and no one was prepared to deal with the rapid increase in infection that swept through our towns and cities. Some local governments fared better than others, and this is the reason why we continue to reach out and dialogue with those who, who in a manner of speaking, successfully initiated their emergency protocols in managing the COVID-19 pandemic. To learn from them and to make their experiences a blueprint in our continuing efforts to contain and bounce back from the immense impact of this worldwide health crisis. I do not wish to take too much of your time as we still have a lot of brilliant speakers and leaders who will share with us their own experiences and to provide us with helpful insights. I wish you a meaningful afternoon that is full of learning and may all of them be translated into actions that will benefit our society, especially the disadvantaged sectors. Once again, maganda at ligtas na hapon sa atin pong lahat. Back to you, Mami Shell. Thank you po, Vice Gov. Um, with that, yan, sabi nga po ni Vice Gov, mahaba po. Uh, marami pong uh, i-feature tayo na speaker sa hapon na ito. So with that, we will now proceed with the highlight of our webinar. But first, let me introduce to you our moderator who will facilitate the discussion. Our moderator is an educator and the former director of Saving Government Leadership Institute. He is the former vice and three-term year of Opal, Misamis Oriental, and he's an outstanding graduate of CLRG's Local Administration and Development Program. 
He is a certified laughter yoga instructor. Let us all welcome Dr. Dixon Yasa. Take it away, sir. Yay, thank you, Mitch. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our uh, discussion this afternoon, our learning session. <laughs> Maybe we need to laugh for a few seconds before we start. <laughs> Laughter is the best medicine. Okay, as, as discussed by Mitch, each presenter, the, our local leaders, will have 20 minutes each. Um, we need to manage time because we need to spend more time for the open forum. Uh, for the 20 minutes, I'd like to ask the presenters, three minutes before the time, I will call your attention to wrap up your presentation if that's okay with you, no? so, so that we can really ensure that we observe the 20 minute time allotment. And I know there are so many things you want to share, but uh, we want also to listen to the participants so that we have more time for the open forum. So we have five resource persons this afternoon, five speakers and one reactor. So let's start with the sharing of the municipality of Alang Alang Leyte. We are so glad that we have this afternoon, Mayor Labelle and you. Good afternoon, Ma'am Labelle. It's your turn now. Good afternoon, Good afternoon po, Doc Yasai. Good afternoon. Uh, most especially to all who are attending this webinar, especially to my cause speaker, our Honorable Governor of the Province of Leyte, Governor Mick Pitilia. Uh, our cause speakers also to the professor and dean of, U of uh, UPNC PAG, Sir Dan Sagil, Attorney Catherine Agapay, the, the national president of the LVGP, and at the same time, Honorable Dixon Yasai, former mayor of Opol, and at the same time, one of my, my mentor when I enrolled in UPNC PAG, CLRG, and at the same time to the reactor, Honorable Vice Governor Christine Garin of the province of Iloilo, Ngan ham mga taga alang-alang, ngan taga late, ngan nagkikita ngan na mamatiyan na, maupay nga kulok ha iyong atanan. Before I begin, I would like to give thanks to the CLRG and CIPAG of UP and the League of Vice Governors of the Philippines for inviting me in this very relevant and timely activity and for giving me the opportunity to share the good and best practices done by our LGU in alang-alang late in the management of the COVID-19 crisis. So to start with the presentation, uh, I'll begin by introducing to you our lovely municipality of Alang Alang. Alang Alang is one of the towns in the province of Leyte in Eastern Visayas Region A. The town of Alang Alang is near Tacloban, which is approximately 30 to 40 minutes travel away. As seen on the slide, I don't know if the slide is, if you could see the slide there. As seen on the slide, Alang Alang is a second class municipality with an IRA of 168 million pesos with a total land area of 15,000 hectares while the population is expected to exceed 60,000 in the ongoing census. Since Alang Alang is located inland, our main industry here is farming or agriculture. Then next, I will go directly to the development or progress of COVID-19 cases in the municipality. After President Duterte announced the travel ban in Metro Manila on March 12, 2020, a massive exodus of Alang 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 Alanganos hurriedly returned home. During the initial period, we were regularly monitoring more than 500 returning individuals or PUMs in the municipality. We were strict with the monitoring because that time, the PCR testing lab in the region was not yet operational. Swab testing are only done for those individuals who are exhibiting flu-like symptoms or are considered PUIs. And then the swab samples need, are, are need, needs to be sent to Cebu City for testing. Thus, we were very careful in monitoring our PUMs and to ensure that they comply with the mandatory 14-day quarantine. Midway in the month of May, we started allowing people to return home with the return of the LSIs or the locally stranded individuals. That is why, as shown in the chart, the number of our PUMs and PUIs started to rise. Then on the other hand, this chart 
shows the confirmed or positive cases of COVID-19 as well as the recoveries. On June 12, 2020, we had our first sudden appearance of positive cases with a total of 17 cases. So we did not, uh, hindi kami dumaan ng 0, 0, 1, or 2 cases. Immediately 17, all of whom are returning residents, ROFs and LSIs. And then from June to July, all of our confirmed cases were uh, merely returning residents. No local transmission was happening. However, when many were uh, many more positive cases were occurring all throughout the province, especially in Tacloban during the month of August up until September and October, that was when uh, things got difficult. As of now, we have 69 cases, 69 positive cases. 58% of those are locally acquired and 42 are imported, imported cases, meaning coming from the LSIs and ROFs. Uh, but before that, uh, on August 2, I would like also to present to you the situation on, uh, on the local transmission that occurred here in our municipality. On August 2, 2020, the swab test result of a police officer residing in the Poblacion of Alang Alang turned out positive for COVID-19. Then on August 11, 2020, the swab test result of the child of that police officer turned out positive also because the police officer is considered a poor. And at the same time, uh, immediately the Municipal Interagency Task Force decided to impose a partial localized and temporary lockdown over the area where the police officer and his child were residing as a precautionary measure against the spread of COVID-19. So on August 2, the swab test result of a police officer residing in the Poblacion or the town proper of Alang Alang turned out positive, wherein he uh, infected also. The virus was transmitted to his child. And then we had a temporary lockdown to that area. And then fortunately, all of their close contacts were negative and the temporary lockdown only lasted less than 72 hours up until the time that the result was released. Next was on August 18, we also had cases where the family members of a positive healthcare worker in the regional hospital, uh, EVRMC in Tacloban, were infected also by COVID. But after assessment by the contact tracing team, there was no need for a temporary lockdown since the family did not expose themselves much to their neighbors. So in our municipality, we only impose lockdowns if it is really necessary. So we carefully assess the situation in order to properly determine the necessity of temporary lockdown. So that's why even if the announcement is made on Sunday evening, immediately the following day, like early morning on Sunday, we do the emergency meeting with the interagency task force so we could immediately assess as to the need for a temporary lockdown in that specified area. Next uh, was on August 26, an unfortunate incident happened when a resident of our town who was awaiting his swab test result suddenly died. He was a dialysis patient and was exposed to another dialysis patient in Tacloban City pending the swab test result we immediately caused the burial of uh, his deceased body. Later that day, his test result turned out positive for COVID-19. So that's why uh, it was not the end yet of our predicaments. On September 2, 2020, after the announcement of this dialysis patient who died, a total of nine contacts of the di deceased dialysis patient living in the same barangay, in Barangay San Vicente, tested positive for COVID-19 also. So immediate action was needed. So I convened the Municipal Interagency Task Force and we decided to impose a temporary lockdown in the barangay where the local transmission occurred. And then thankfully, the spread of COVID-19 was contained and the other swab test results of the other close contacts were negative for COVID-19. And then the most recent case, another upward, we have this incident wherein an, uh, an engineer working in the DPWH tested positive and then uh, during the contract tracing, 
four of his family members. On the first level, contact his wife and his child. And then second level, contact the mother of his wife and the, and, and the brother tested positive also with the virus. So after convening the interagency task force, we determined that there was a need for a temporary lockdown because of the extent of exposure. Up, nag-reach nag kami ng fourth level contact tracing to this uh, with the family of the with the family of the engineer. And then fortunately, the contact tracing and testing showed no other those contacts of the family. And 90% uh, nito na exposed yung, uh, yung, yung engineer, we had the swabbing also. And then this incident was very critical because we were operating the maximum capacity of quarantine facilities, especially reserved for positive cases. We have to make sure that the spread of COVID-19 is prevented and contained. And then, what are the challenges and strategies that we adopted? So, uh, I will highlight five of the challenges we faced. First is the connection and communication. The first challenge is obviously the connection and the communication between the LGU to the public and to the connection and the connection among the LGU offices. Because of the community quarantine and the observance of physical distancing, the conventional method of physical meetings is very risky and not advisable. So what we did, first we used the online platforms. The solution may not be unique to our LGU, but it surely helped a lot in our COVID-19 response. This solution involved the use of online platforms in our communications and as a substitute for our meetings. More particularly, we used social media such as the Facebook, especially its messenger group chat. So we have a group chat for our, for our COVID-19 task force. And then this tool greatly facilitated the coordination among the LGU offices because in cases of emergencies needing immediate action, the need for physical uh, gathering, uh, physically gathering first the responsible officers is dispensed with because we can communicate through messenger. I can simply message them about the problem and direct that immediate action to be taken, be taken to resolve it. And then in calling for emergency meeting, I can directly inform the members of the LGU ta task force through Facebook. And then um, also, second, uh, physical meeting is, there are some, there, there, there are times that physical meeting is really necessary. So we see to it that the health and safety protocols are complied with especially with the physical distancing. So we have here in the, my presentation, actually, there is a picture of a meeting with the Behertz, wherein as early as March, we have been strictly following these protocols in our meeting, wherein there is physical distancing all with our COVID task force. Then we also have the lovely Alang Alang Facebook page. So this is another important way the online platform helped us was in connecting with the public. So we have a Facebook page, we call it Lovely Alang Alang, where our post updates on our COVID-19 response, the activities being undertaken by the LGU and the utilization and expenditure involving the COVID-19 funds for transparency purposes are being posted. So that's why we were also recognized by the freedom of information for our transparency and transparency of our budget wherein we upload everything to Facebook so that our constituents, my fellow Alang Alanganons, would also see and uh, uh, kumbaga, they are well updated with our report. And then we also have the COVID monitoring updates. We also uh, post it in our Facebook page wherein the monitoring updates of PUMs and PUIs together with their barangays are posted and the general details of our COVID-19 cases, like for example, the age from what barangay, uh, is there a history of travel or something like that, we post it online. Second, as what I have mentioned, we also use our page for transparency in COVID-19 funds expenditure. So for example, the breakdown and budget plan for our MDRRMF, uh, our MDREAM fund and the BGCM, everything was uploaded. Even for the relief operations, how much did it cost us? It is all updated and posted. Then third, we also use the page for announcements and clarifications. Uh, for example, our important announcements such as the guidelines for health protocols 
and all other procedures for returning residents, everything is posted on our page. Then second, our next challenge is making our healthcare facilities and capabilities responsive to the COVID-19 pandemic. So what are the solutions? First, we are so thankful that uh, last February, uh, we were granted with the Doctors to the Barrios or DTTB by the DOH because we only have one MHO catering 60,000 residents of our town. And then supposedly, the ideal, uh, the ideal ratio, I guess, should be 1 is to 20,000. So we are thankful that the DOH granted our request as early as uh, February, prior, prior yung COVID. So we were already given two doc additional uh, doctor. Then next, the DOH donation of land ambulance. Through the efforts of the RHU, we also endeavored to avail of the DOH uh, donation of ambulance for our R RHU. So I directed the fast tracking of the requirements and thankfully last June 9, it was granted to us. And actually, it's very useful because uh, kami, all the transit of LSIs, ROFs, kami yung bumagawa. And then uh, we are very much thankful na at least yung, yung BRRM na, na van namin, yun yung ginagamit na namin solely for the transit, for the transportation of LSIs and COVID, parang naging COVID vehicle na namin. Because we already have additional ambulance allocated only for the RHU or for the Rural Health Unit concern. The next uh, solution is the ensuring of proper trainings and adequate equipment. In addition, we always ensure that our RHU prop, uh, personnel are properly trained and adequately equipped to handle COVID-19 cases. So they underwent trainings for the management of returning residents and confirmed cases. We have eight teams of contact tracing teams and also we have uh, three swabbers and now we requested for additional uh, training from the provincial health office so we can add more uh, uh, swabbers in our municipality aside from the assistance DOH has, give, uh, has given to us. And then uh, at the present, some of, the, uh, some of our RHU nurses are undergoing training on how to do swabbing in order to assist our med tech in the swabbing of close contacts. And also in the budgeting of our LGU funds, we always put as number one priority the procurement of PPEs and medical supplies for our frontliners. Then the third challenge, this involves the management of patients in the COVID-19 cases, including the PUMs and PUIs, such as the LSIs and returning OFWs. So first, uh, the management of returning residents upon their arrival during their quarantine period uh, when President Duterte announced last March pa uh, nung pag-uwi pag lahat ng mga residents namin, we gave them food packs for our PUMs just to ensure that they will strictly follow their 14-day quarantine. We are also the one responsible for transporting all LSIs or all ROF, the ROFs, kahit malayo pa, like our staff would travel four hours to the port, kahit ano, uh, to the airport, to the seaport, lahat, kami talaga ang sumusundo. And at the same time, the proper management of our quarantine centers and our temporary treatment and monitoring facility. So, nung panay-announce pa sa Manila na magla-lockdown, ganito ang gagawin, here in our municipality, we have been preparing. So, we have our own municipal quarantine facilities and if we can't accommodate it anymore, pag puno na talaga yung municipal quarantine facilities namin, uh, pinu-forward namin sa barangay kasi pinag-prepare na din namin sila ng barangay quarantine facilities because we don't allow returning residents to stay at their home for home quarantine or what. Then also, um, management of COVID-19 related death. It is also a challenge to manage cases involving COVID-19 related death, suspect or confirmed. So partnering now with funeral parlors is difficult because of safety concerns. So the cemetery must also be ready for the burial of the deceased body within 12 hours. So in our public cemetery, we, pre we prepare dug out grounds so that burial can be made immediately. And then also we augmented swab testing capacity. We don't only partner with EBRMC, who is the only government hospital here doing the swab test, but we, uh, we made a partnership our LGU and our L and other LGUs in the province of Leyte with Divine Word Hospital in Tacloban City. So this was made possible also through the efforts of our good governor, Governor Mick Pitilla, 
So in this arrangement, our LGU can conduct more swab tests on our returning residents and close contacts with cheaper costs. We only pay 1,000 pesos even though it is a private hospital because there is a MOA between us. And then why we, why we did this MOA? Kasi uh, mahirap it will only be depending sa ADRMC because they have also their protocols. For example, for their protocols, sasabihin na pag nag-positive, there should be no risk swab. 14 days quarantine lang release. And then all LSI, hindi nila pinapaswab, lalong-lalo na pag asymptomatic at saka uh, and, uh, at the same time, uh, uh, hindi siya positive sa rapid test, hindi din sinaswab. But we are not confident with that, that we will be releasing uh, our residents, our returning residents, na hindi kami sure kung positive ba to, na asymptomatic lang or what. So pag hindi siya pasok ng EBRMC covered na or DOH covered protocols for swabbing, we forward it to Divine Word Hospital and we only pay 1,000 pesos. Then, so to refresh our challenges, first is the connection or communication among LGU offices and the LGU to the public, healthcare capacity that is responsive to COVID-19 and the management of COVID-19 cases. So the next, uh, next, the fourth and the fifth challenges, so this already involves the community. Fourth is the implementation of health and safety measure against COVID-19. So our issuances here, uh, we issued more than 20, 24, I guess, uh, executive orders from the time that uh, the lockdown was declared. Social gatherings are prohibited. Up until now, uh, uh, we, we are in liquor ban. Our municipality is in liquor ban. We just... Uh, 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 binalik namin yung liquor ban just this uh, September nung tumaas na naman yung cases namin and the, and the contact tracing majority 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 this involves yung mga nagiinuman mga ganun so binalik lang muna namin temporarily and then also uh, general community quarantine implemented beginning March 21 2020 wherein we activated our checkpoints we also had the home quarantine pass uh, to ensure that we, we, we limit the number of residents or number of individuals coming to our public market or doing the transactions o yung mga lumalabas ng bahay. Then next, we also have the disinfection of public places. We do the disinfection in our public market, in our municipal hall. Then the relocation of our farmer's market day. So meron pa, pa rin kaming market day but we do it in our uh, Alang Alang Town Plaza so that at least we can control the crowd entering. And then for the new normal, we had this transaction pass. So up until now, up, up, up until now we have this color-coded transaction pass scheduled. Hinate namin yung barangay because we have 54 barangays, 27, 27. Other 27 can do the transactions in the public market and, and in other establishments every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Then the other one, can do their transactions TTHS so that we can limit the number of people uh, going out, going in and out of these uh, public places. Then uh, we had the application of, of health certificates if they wanted to go to Tacloban or to the nearby municipalities and cities because this is needed. We had it, we had the online processing or the e-health certificates on, online processing. And for those now, walang cell phones, ganon. Uh, sila lang yung may fast lane that uh, they can get the health certificates every afternoon. And then the fifth challenge is addressing the needs of the vulnerable sector. So first is through the social amelioration program wherein uh, we were also given a commendation by DSWD for uh, implementing it on time. We had our validators and then at the same time, I, form, I formed a grievance committee wherein it was participated per committee ng uh, representative from the academe, representative from the church, and one representative from the LGU. They're the one who go down to the barangay to help us address if there are mga issues na sasabi ng mga pinupolitika, ganun. So what we did, ginawa namin tatlo na may member ng church, ng, ng academe, mga teachers, one minute, para ganun. Yes? One minute to lang po. No overtime na tayo eh. Sige. Thank you. Okay. I can't hear anymore. What was that? Uh, wrap up na lang, Mayor. One minute. Uh, one okay, minute wrap okay, up na. Okay. So that's it. Uh, 
yes, uh, we have the relief operation, securing food availability uh, by supporting the agricultural sector. All our re relief operations, we purchase the rice from our local farmers to help them. We have the fertilizer subsidy, the vegetable seeds, or, or the, the food always in the home, and at the same time, cash assistance to our tanods, to our BHW, to the uh, tricycle and pedicab drivers. And also our support to the education sector, wherein we realigned 2 million funds for the provision of uh, six risograph machines to our students uh, to, uh, for, to be utilized by our teachers for the reproduction of self-learning worksheets. So to summarize this part of our, con uh, of our uh, discussion, the major problems are the connection and communication, the healthcare capacity that is responsive to COVID-19, the management of our COVID-19 cases, the implementation of health and safety measures, and addressing the needs of the vulnerable sector. And we are so thankful that because of uh, our transparency, uh, we received so many donations. Many donated mga PPEs, cash assistance to our LGUs, and at the same time, with what uh, doc, uh, with what uh, Sir Dick, uh, Sir Dan had uh, told us earlier, now. Our, our decisions should not be delayed. The fast action of our LGU frontliners is a must ngayon. Timeliness really matters. And I am thankful that I have a very active LGU frontliners, my eight contact tracing teams, yung mga swabbers, yung mga DRR responders, lahat. Kasi uh, kahit wala na silang time for our set, so wala nang time sa mga, like for myself, for my family, or like kahit sa mga, yung mga ibang responders. Binabali wala muna ngayon just to ensure that we can provide the best and uh, quality service just to ensure that we will be meeting all the challenges and difficulties we are facing because of this COVID-19. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I hope nakakuha din kayo ng ideya kahit the presentation was not visible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Love. It was a very comprehensive presentation. Maski hindi na nakita slides but we fully understood what you were saying, um, just I, I highlighted three things lang, yung the use of digital technology, not just for discussions, conversation, but even for online processing the e-governance. And second, thank you for really promoting good governance. Um, you are a model for transparency. You are putting everything on the Facebook, the initiatives of COVID, for COVID response, and even your expenditures. And the third, thank you for taking good care of the vulnerables. Salamat po, Mayor Lab. Please wait. Thank you. Thank you. Forum. Salamat, salamat. Thank you, Mayor Lab. We will have the open forum later. Thank you. Our next resource person um, is the governor of Dinagat Island. She's going to present for 20 minutes the story of Dinagat in responding to COVID, how they rose to the challenge of the pandemic. Let us all welcome Governor Eileen Aka Bagao. Go. Thank you, Mayor Yahai, and thank you to the Center for Local and Regional Governance, the CLRG, the National College of Public Administration of the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and to the League of Vice Governors of the Philippines. Um, a little profile about uh, Dinagat Islands. Dinagat Islands is one of the newest provinces in the Philippines, created in 2006 and carved out of Surigao del Norte. It is the northernmost province in Mindanao, and we are a fourth-class province and the 11th poorest in the whole country. And based on the DSWD data, uh, the Dinagat Islands has a 50.9% poverty incidence. Uh, and uh, and uh, we are located in the Caraga region with Surigao del Norte to our south, Leyte to our west, Eastern Summer to our north, and Siargao Island and the Pacific Ocean to our east. Um, and we have a total land area of around uh, 85,000 hectares, a population of almost 130,000. And uh, our province is composed of seven municipalities uh, and 100 barangays. And of our 100 barangays, 76 are in coastal areas where fishing is the primary source of livelihood. And in other areas, uh, fishing and farming are the dominant uh, forms of uh, sources of income of our citizens. We are a key bi biodiversity area as determined by the Department of Environment and Natural Resources with a high level of endemism among our flora and fauna. 
We have our own subspecies of tarsier. And aside from that, we also have the Dinagat gymnur, which has been declared by the Edge Species Program of the Zoological Society of London as one of the top 100 most evolutionary distinct and globally endangered species in the entire world. And in spite of this, mining has a tangible presence in our islands and large-scale mining has destroyed many of our forests and diluted rivers and watersheds in the province. There are at least 19 approved mineral production share agreements or MPSAs and three joint operating agreements that occupy more than half of our land area. And in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, since the first case of COVID-19 was reported in our country in, on January 30, 2020, we were able to ensure that our province remained COVID-free for more than six and months and 23 days. We were one of the last provinces to accomplish this, no? including Kirino. And we currently have three active confirmed cases, while 11 have already recovered. All of these cases are what we call LSIs, or Dinagatnon, so have recently returned to our province from places that are known to have either local or community transmission. Uh, and right now, we can still say that uh, there, are, there is no local or community transmission of COVID-19 in the whole province. Fortunately, all our cases have either been asymptomatic or are mild cases. We can't afford to have local or community transmission here in Dinagat because we have no fully functioning hospital. We only have three informally lev informally level district hospitals. We have, we have a total of 16 doctors working in our provincial and municipal governments. Our doctor to patient ratio is 1 to 8,000 persons and far from the 1 to the 1, 000, uh, 1 to 1,000 ratio prescribed by the World Health Organization. A few days after the first reported case in the country, we immediately convened our provincial interagency task force to decide on what to do. We issued the first executive order of the provincial government related to COVID-19 on February 3, 2020. And immediately after our PAATF meeting, dividing all the national agencies and all the uh, workers in the provincial government to be assigned into teams primarily to monitor the prices of goods and the availability, availability of goods uh, in our province. And it also can contain initial uh, prevent, uh, prevention protocols uh, and health uh, protocols. And since we are an island province, we made sure that ports of entry were limited to each municipality. And in these ports, personnel from the provincial government, municipal LGUs, and our national law enforcement partners would screen each and every passenger and crew members who arrived, determining their travel history. On care and containment, eventually, and very early on, we already foresaw that home quarantine should no longer be the singular option to ensure the prevention of the spread of COVID-19. And we had to be creative. We didn't have funds to immediately construct new buildings, so we used schools that were not in use since they were in any classes, as well as evacuation centers and gymnasium. As early as um, February and early March, uh, uh, we established the Municipal Care and Containment Centers, or the MCCCs, for the municipalities. As time went by, we saw an influx of outsiders who happened to work in national line agencies within the province. This gave rise to the establishment of agency-based care and containment centers, or ACCCs, as well as office quarantine options. As long as the agencies had sufficient spaces for isolating their employees, while still being able to work in the province. We also transformed our provincial guest center into our first provincial care and containment center or PCCC, which was meant to house provincial capital employees who returned to Dinagat Islands after traveling outside. The Department of Education also allowed us to use one of the schools near our capital as our second provincial care and containment center, which was used to house those who come from the different municipalities when their MCCCs could no longer accommodate them. We also established what we call the uh, embassy, embassy which is located in the ports where uh, our guests can go there and transact business only for one day when, where they don't have to go through quarantine uh, protocols. We take our quarantine protocols seriously 
since this is the primary means for us to first detect COVID-19 since we did not have any immediate access to proper testing. And second, this was the best way for us to prevent local transmission in case our returning Dinagatlons were infected with the virus. We call those who finish the 14-day quarantine period in our care and containment centers as graduates, which is our way to ensure positive reinforcement when it comes to our communication strategies. Graduate is a positive term. It means those who completed their quarantine period uh, accomplished where they accomplished something important. We want our people to feel that if they voluntarily undergo the isolation and monitoring period in our care and containment centers, they are being part of the solution to the challenge we are facing. This is in part the reason why we use the hashtag in our campaign on COVID-19 as hashtag our communities are frontline. We regularly release COVID-19 related news and information through all our media platforms, radio, television, and social media, however limited. And in all our communication tools, we always ensure that positive reinforcement is employed. We refer to locally stranded individuals and returning overseas Filipinos as returning dinagatmons. We refer to their arrival as homecoming. We make them feel welcome even if we know the risks associated with their return. We put our messages that seek to explain what stigma is and why we shouldn't discriminate against our fellow citizens and human beings. And instead of simply releasing updates on new confirmed cases, we include messages of reassurance to prevent fear from taking over. And because our information releases are comprehensive, the people themselves have become our front lines in fighting fake news. They are even our front lines in manning our provincial borders. The numbers, data, and scientific information released equips them with knowledge. The messages of reassurance that we include with this builds their trust. And because they have acquired knowledge and formed trust in our government, they are our best line of defense against misinformation. When we talk to the people about our protocols, we avoid discussing punishments and penalties. Personally, I think that the best way to make people follow rules is to make them respect those rules. Being afraid breeds negativity. And we want the people to appreciate our protocols because they understand the values that are embedded in them, which allows us to foster a better sense of community where citizens can police each other because of their concern for each other. And to further emphasize the sense of community in our response, after the first, my first executive order, ne nearly all our orders as well as issuances from our League of Municipalities were signed by me, our Vice Governor, the Department of Interior and Local Government Provincial Director is the Vice Chair of our PIATF, and every mayor in the seven municipalities. This showed to the people that their leaders, regardless of political affiliation, are united in this health and economic crisis. In each of our executive orders, we include FAQs, a frequently asked questions, and we write them in Visaya so that they can all understand the discussions that are in those orders. Our doctors in the provincial government and municipal LGUs also play a vital part in the crafting and enforcement of our protocols. It is important for us to have evidence, information, policies, to ensure that our rules are grounded on reality, medical science, and most importantly, human behavior. After every provincial IATF meetings, we have new or revised guidelines. We adjust to the changing context brought about by the health situation, by national directives, and by what is happening in the Karaga region. And even if we were a separate island, we are still part of Region 13 which meant that whatever happens to the Surigao, Agusan provinces, affect us in Dinagat Islands. If you are fortunate to have a very active regional development council and a very active task force against COVID-19, we even call it One Caraga Shield. This is because we listen to each other in an online video conferences in the same way that we provincial and municipal officials listen to each other in pay ATF meetings. We even have agreements on regional border controls and common policies on health and quarantine procedures. Aside from this, we also look at our communities not as victims of the pandemic and its economic effects. We see our citizens as our first line of defense, 
our front lines. For instance, in ensuring food security, those who are often forgotten by society and government, the poorest of our basic sectors, our farmers and fisher folk became our heroes, as they should always be, with or without pandemic. We developed the ISDA project, which provided a 30 peso subsidy to the fish being bought by citizens for a market basis. In turn, to qualify for the subsidy, the vendors had to purchase from small or artisanal fisher folk. And this made sure that our poorest fisher folk had a steady source of income while guaranteeing profit for market vendors and at the same time, ensuring that there is food on the table for our families. And moreover, this allowed us to also prevent the increase of prices of fish in our marketplaces or mercado. We also distributed 30-day power seeds that allowed not only farmers but also our households to plant vegetables that they can harvest after a month. This ensured food for our home gardeners and their families and an ample supply for our marketplaces. Most of these harvests are also sold to municipal care and containment centers and provincial care and containment centers to feed those who are in quarantine. Due to the increasing supply of fish and farm produce, which was difficult for our farmers and fisher folk to sell outside our province because of the lockdown and local protocols, we decided to open a makeshift marketplace every second and third Thursday of the month at our capital. We call it Tabo sa Capitolio. Aside from farmers and fisher folk, people's organizations, cooperatives, and small business owners are also joined. And this allowed us to bring back the vibrance of our local economy in spite of not being able to cross the sea for our commercial activities with nearby provinces. Two other sectors that we tapped were women and persons with disabilities. We provided them with capital to sue face masks to be distributed to our frontliners and citizens and to cook meals for our care and containment centers. And by doing all of these, we are providing human rights education to our citizens without lecturing about what human rights are. We showed them firsthand how we address the right to food and the right to a decent life. In every action we take, whenever we meet in the provincial IATF, we always ask which rights do these protocols and programs address and how do we involve the people in claiming and exercising these rights. Here in Dinagat Islands, in our battle against COVID-19, everyone has a part to play and by everyone, I do not only mean those in government and our health workers. Our citizens are our front lines and our communities are our front lines. Now, our youth sector is now stepping up to the challenge. Because we implemented a travel ban for foreign and local tourists in our province, we, need, we needed to boost our tourism sector. With this, we developed a competition among our Sangunian Kabataan, Kabataan leaders, our SK leaders, who established their own tour operations and management businesses. They created affordable tour packages for fellow Dinagatnons who have never been to our beautiful tourist destinations. In my conversations with our citizens, I found out that those in the northernmost towns have never been to our towns in the south and vice versa. Why wait for outsiders to discover our breathtaking islands when our own citizens haven't had that opportunity? And by the way, we have more than 200 islands in Dinagat Islands. Along with this, we found that this was also the perfect opportunity to introduce conservation in our governance. Through our SK Leaders Contest, we have now kick-started our community conservation tourism, part of our Kalikasang Buhay initiatives which is beyond educating people about nature. It is about opening hearts and minds to the relationship between communities and the coasts, forests, and watersheds that cradle them. This initiative promotes values that are integral to building responsible communities, responsible for the protection of nature, and responsible for the well-being of each and every member, especially during this time. Conservation, is a crucial component of our COVID-19 response. If we lose our watersheds, we will lose access to potable water, to water for proper hand washing and hygiene. Our environment is and will always be our shield against any calamity, be it typhoon or a virus, 
which means we must ensure that conservation is a top priority in our governance. To summarize, our relatively successful performance in battling the COVID-19 pandemic is due to the following. One, early and decisive action guided by the consultation and, this, and debates and um, uh, listening to all the conversations with different sectors in different communities and barangays. Number two, rights-based and evidence-informed policies that seek the people's respect instead of fear. Number three, empowerment of vulnerable sectors in ensuring food security and local economic activities and ensuring that there is balance between health and economic concerns. Number four, positive communications and transparency. And number five, inter-LGU cooperation from municipality to the region, including engagement with national line agencies working in the province. Because of all of these, we are still able to guarantee food security and the vibrance of our local economy. Our people can still enjoy the freedom of movement with social distancing, of course, and wearing of face masks. At the end of the day, in facing a pandemic, it should always be facts over fear, values over punishment. The people should always be given a seat at the table of governance. And when policies and protocols adjust to the situation, we have to make sure that our people's rights will always remain unaffected from the right to health to the right to food and the right to livelihood. People may say that it is easy for us in Dinagat Islands to prevent COVID-19 transmission because we are allegedly a geographically isolated and disadvantaged area. Such a label for places like Dinagat Islands come from, from the perspective of those who have privilege and access to the usual opportunities enjoyed by those in the mainland or landlocked locations. But from where we stand, what we have successfully isolated so far is the virus. From where we stand, the seed that supposedly isolates us continues to give us life. That is our story in the Nagat Islands, and I hope that what I have shared will be beneficial for our viewers and participants. Dagang salamat, ugmayong hapon. Wow, thank you very much, sir. Governor Kaka. It was a very inspiring story how you managed, how you led the Dinagat. Uh, three points long. You're so good in orchestrating the LGU, the, the different local government units, even if there are political differences. Thank you, for the, thank you for showing the way and how you orchestrate the different agencies. And second, thank you for calling the isolation unit as care and containment. Thank you for using the word care and transforming, trying to transform the minds of the Nagatnons that they are not victims, but now they become frontliners. Wow, we are learning from you. So when you speak of frontliners, it's the citizen. Thank you, uh, Governor Kaka. Salamat. We have the open forum, uh, Governor. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for sticking to 20 minutes. <laughs> Salamat, Governor. Uh, later, we'll entertain questions during the open forum. Thank you. And our third speaker um, is the Governor of uh, Leyte. Now, this, from the story of the Nagat Island, now the story of Leyte. We are so proud to have with us this afternoon, Governor Leopoldo Domenico Mick Pitilia. Go. Good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon, uh, Dixon. And uh, siguro, before anything else, I would like to thank muna ang ating mga organizers, yung League of Vice Governors of the Philippines, yung Center for Local and Regional Governance, yung National College for Public Administration and Governance, UP Diliman, and all our guests who are uh, Mr. Dan uh, Sagil, ang, of the, ang Dean ng uh, Professor and Dean of the National College for Public Administration and Governance, uh, Alicia Celestino, ang ating uh, Director for uh, Center for Local and Regional Governance of UP, Attorney Karina Gapay, Vice Governor, Province of Laguna, and the President of uh, League of Vice Governors. Of course, Dixon, ang ating uh, moderator today. Mayor Lubel Anyu, ang isa sa aking, I think, the youngest mayor ng Leyte at uh, pinakabagandang, isa sa pinakabagandang munisipyo dito, yung Alang Alang, Leyte. Uh, Vice Governor Christine Garin, Province of Iloilo. 
Governor Arlene Bagao no? and uh, of the province of uh, Dinagat Island. And I, I, I think nandito rin si Governor, uh, Governor Kwa of the province of Pirino, ang aking idol na governor, ang chairman ng ating League of Provinces. And I think, I don't know kung nandito si Mayor Magalong, uh, <clears throat> Governor Kadyao, and all the guests and participants for uh, today's uh, forum. Uh, ang ginawa ko na lang dito, uh, uh, we just, uh, para hindi ako mag-overtalk at lumagpas sa time limit, so pinagawa ko na lang ng video yung ating presentation para tuloy-tuloy na <laughs> hindi na tayo. <laughs> Kasi ba bawal daw magsalita na marami ngayon. The less talk, the less virus. Parang ganon. So, but before anything else, about late, we have uh, around 1.8 million ang population. Uh, we have uh, uh, 570,000 uh, hectares of uh, land in the province of Leyte. And we have 40 municipalities, one component city, the city of Baybay. Uh, by the way, Ormoc and Tacloban cities are, all, are both independent cities, so hindi na under sa ating jurisdiction. We have 1,394 barangays all over the province of Leyte. So you can just imagine. No? So uh, siguro kung uh, kalahati ng Leyte, the eastern part speaks waray-waray. So the western part naman speaks Cebuano. So uh, kami sa Leyte, kalahati lang yung tapang waray. Kalahati lang. So kumbaga, hindi kami takot sa bagyo, hindi kami takot sa COVID, hindi kami takot sa gera, pero takot lang kami sa mga misis. Kalahati lang. <laughs> so anyway, uh, please uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, I-play na lang natin ang uh, presentation, but I will be here to answer any questions later. Thank you, Paul. Magandang hapon sa ating lahat. Uh, in any calamity, no doubt na ang gusto ka agad natin manyari ay eh, makabalik tayo sa normal. That's human instinct. So ngayon na nandito ang COVID, how do we get back to normal? Walang iba kundi we have to, kailangan talunin natin ang virus. And so to beat the virus, dapat let's prevent transmission. Paano ba mag makahawa ang corona? Uh, to put it simply, dalawa lang yan. Lalabas lang yan sa ilong o kaya bibig ng isang tao sa pamamagitan ng pag-ubo at saka yung pag-sneeze. No? And then, sa ilong lang din yan o kaya bibig papasok sa nahawaan niya. So kaya ang pinaka-importante dito, face mask. And during the first 5 to 7 days, although may virus ka, siguro wala ka pang symptom niyan. Ang tawag niyan is asymptomatic. After 5 to 7 days, pag dumami na yan sa lalamunan o sa ilong mo, so ang viral load mo tataas to the point na ang katawan i-reject na siya. No? Mag-uubo ka na niyan o kaya mag-sneeze ka na. Dating sa point na yan, ang tawag sa'yo ay isang symptomatic na, na may mild case na symptom ka na. No, ito yung tinatawag nating super spreader. Kasi nakakalakad ka pa, nakakapag-drive ka pa, nakakapag-trabaho ka pa, tapos may symptomas ka, tapos mataas pa ang viral load mo, eh talagang ang chances makahawa ka mataas. Ngayon, kung patuloy pa yan, from 7 to 10 days or, or more, bababa yan sa lungs, at saka doon naman sa lungs, dadami yan. So pag dumami na yan dyan, dyan ka na manghihina, no? kulang ng oxygen katawan, mahirap huminga, yun na yung mga symptoms. No? No? Then, pag nangyari yan, eh, talagang kailangan daghin ka na sa ospital. Ang tawag sa yan ngayon, it's either severe or critical case. Kumbaga sa tatlong grupo na yan, yung pinaka malakas mga hawa talaga dyan, yung may mild symptom. Also, during the 5th at 7th day, doon na mag, may lalabas na sa katawan mo na tinatawag na antibody. Ang antibodies are chemicals na pinoproduce ng cells natin kung sakaling mayroong mga foreign things na pumapasok sa katawan, like coronavirus. So, ang antibody, yung chemicals na yan, siya naman ang pumapatay sa virus. So, ano ang ginawa natin sa province? No? In March, nung si President Duterte nag-declare uh, ng ECQ, ng lockdown ng entire Luzon, dito sa province of Leyte, nagpalabas din tayo ng executive order declaring the province of Leyte under GCQ. Pero hinighlight din namin doon sa GCQ na mandatory ang 
pagsusuot ng face mask in public place and public transport. And also, sinama din natin doon na pinagbabawal din natin yung may mga sintomas, yung may mga ubo, yung may mga tangkaso at that time, wala pa kaming testing noon eh. So, inano na muna natin na huwag mo nang lalabas sa bahay, bawal din sila sa mga public places at saka public transport. Uh, part of the preparations also noong February, uh, nag-start na tayo mag-review at saka mag-harden ng mga protocols natin sa mga district at provincial hospitals. Nagsimula na tayo training sa mga tao on how to handle patients para hindi makapaghawaan dyan sa mga pasyente at saka mga healthcare workers sa ospital. Isa pang ginawa natin doon, trinain natin yung mga medtechs and nurses natin all over the province. No? Kahit sa mga munisipyo, trinain natin ng swabbing. So lahat ng munisipyo sa Leyte, including yung component city of Baybay, uh, may mga swabbers yan. At saka also on that month, tong February, we started procuring yung mga, mga disinfectants, yung mga PPEs, yung mga test kits. No? Mayroon pa tayong in order yun na ventilators, lahat ng mga kailangan natin. Mga mid-April, nagkaroon kami ng first case namin dito. So, talagang takot na takot lahat kasi first case, pati ang ating mga staff sa Provincial Health Office. Ang first case natin is from Guam. Citizen siya doon, pero taga Leyte. Before the lockdown ng Luzon, umuwi siya ng Manila, nag-shopping sa Green Hills. Dan doon yung ano natin, yung uh, ground zero natin noon sa Green Hills. And then, nag-land trip siya pa uwi. Uh, kasama niya sa pag-uwi, yung mga kamag-anak niya kasi sinundo siya doon. So, in a 12-seater van, uh, 16 sila lahat, no, bumiyahe. More than 24 hours na biyahe. And then, at that time, hindi pa uso yung face mask. When we found out later on na uh, meron siyang virus, kasama yung 15 sa van sa contact tracing, mga negative lahat. Again, that was the case kasi siya, wala pa siyang symptom. Asymptomatic pa siya. Pero although later on, nagkasymptom siya. So to sum it up, I think we swabbed around more than 70 people. Kasi talagang siniguro namin. <laughs> oh, lahat maswab, no? And then, it turns out, all of them nag-negative except for one. No? Nag-positive. Uh, kaya nga pag nakita nyo later on sa data namin, we have two nung April. Ang nahawa niya yung pamangkin niya, nagsishare sila ng room sa bahay. Pareho silang symptomatic. Tapat sila sa bahay, meron pa silang dalawang kasama. Hindi tayo na contento, pinarapid test pa rin natin. It turns out, nag-positive sila sa rapid. No? Bakit? Kasi mukhang silang lahat sa bahay nahawaan. Kasi symptomatic yung index case natin. Pero yung dalawa, kasi mga asymptomatic lang sila, madaling nakarecover. So by the time na pinicr test sila, mga wala ng virus. Next question, eh, saan ba pinakamataas ang transmission rate? Just like the first case, naubos niya mahawaan yung household niya. Pero yung ibang pinuntahan niya, wala siyang nahawaan. It's because naka-face mask siya lagi at that time. So parang mataas talaga ang risk ng hawaan sa bahay. More than doon sa mga offices, sa mga farms, sa mga supermarkets, parang ganon. Bakit? Kasi doon sa mga offices at saka sa mga business establishments, merong pinapatupad doon na mga protocols. For as long as people are wearing their face mask at saka walang mga symptom, so wala tayong risk dyan. Pero sa bahay, wala yung protocol. Walang nag face mask dyan. <laughs> diba? We know that. Also, yung na-observe natin dun sa contact tracing, sa mga result ng contact tracings natin, yung mga activities, yung mga gatherings na pinakamataas ang risk ng hawaan. Gatherings ng mga people who are close to each other. Dito sa Leyte, subukan mo dito nasa supermarket ka, tapos tanggalin mo yung face mask mo. Uh, maya-maya, ting- pag- paglingon mo yan, tinititigan ka na ng lahat. Diba? Hindi lang yan simpleng titig. Titig waray pa yan. Diba? Mukhang tinitigan ka pa lang, mukhang nabugbog ka na. <laughs> Parang gano'n ang feeling mo. <laughs> Mawari-wari ito eh. Bago dumating yung mga LSIs at saka OFWs, nag-usap-usap na kami ng mga mayors na bawal ang home quarantine. Nagka-agree kami ng procedures, ng process, protocols para sa mga LSIs. At the time na naman kasi wala masyadong bumibiyahe, so wala tayong risk noon. Nung dumating yung mga LSIs at OFWs, ang ginawa natin as agreed with the mayors na susunduin sila sa mga pier, sa mga airports, sa mga bus terminal. Itong mga dumadating, 
nagsusunduin sila at nagdadadhin sila doon sa munisipyo diretso doon sa mga quarantine areas nila sa quarantine facilities and then nire-require natin ng 14-day quarantine at saka kung wala kang virus di pwede ka nang umuwi karamihan pa rin ang munisipyo dinagdagan pa nila sinaswab nila pagdating in the end parang pinalakas pa natin ito sa pamamagitan ng isang ordinance na ginawa nila Vice Go at saka mga board members na lahat ng mga dumadating from other regions dito sa mga munisipyo sa Leyte are required to sign in doon sa mga municipal health office. May penalty pag hindi ka mag-sign in. Ever since nagdatingan yung LSIs noong May dito sa Leyte, yung mga dumating dito sa Leyte, hanggang ngayon, wala pa tayong record na LSI na nakahawa ng local. Uh, so at least hanggang ngayon, wala tayong problema sa kami sa Leyte, wala tayong problema sa LSIs. Sa Region 8, uh, five of the six provinces bawal ang home quarantine. One of the two independent cities bawal ang home quarantine. So meron pa rin nag-allow ng home quarantine. Ang problema nito kasi these places, yung mga taga doon sa mga lugar na to, eh halos lahat yan, may kamag-anak yan, may kapatid, may best friend, may classmate ng high school na taga late. Eh. Pag may nag-positive dito sa mga neighboring natin, nag-contact rin siya, usually meron talagang masasama na taga late. Eh. The minute na sinabi na kailangan i-contact trace or close contact siya, the minute na malaman, ang proseso natin dyan is dadalhin ka agad sa quarantine facility yan. And then isa swab at saka maghihintay ng uh, swab results niya doon sa quarantine facility. Kailangan mauna yung pag-transfer sa quarantine kasi ang quarantine or isolation, siya ang nakakatigil ng transmission at hindi yung testing. And so far naman, wala tayong naging out of control. Pag meron mang sa isang taon tumataas, in less than a week, several days, nakukontrol na kaagad yan, natitigil na natin ang transmission. Wala tayong outbreak so far dito sa province of Leyte. Now, let us look at the numbers. Uh, sa first slide na to, makita natin yung summary as of October 3. So, we have asymptomatic, 86%, mild, 12%, severe, 0.56%, and critical is 0.31%. Kung napapansin nyo yung kabuokan, yung 1,614, what is the impression? Ang 1,614, karamihan yan ay low risk na mga asymptomatics because ang nagpadami nito itong mga LSI. So, kung tutusin, itong 1,614, medyo mababa ang risk. No? Ang high risk lang namin dito ay yung 200 one na mild cases. Yun lang yung naging high risk natin. Again, ang severe critical, nasa ospital na yan, hindi na makakahawa. No? In fact, if you compare this to the national average, uh, I'm quite sure nakita nyo yan sa TV. No? Ang national average, mild cases ang pinakamarami, which comprises mga 86% are mild cases usually. So, we have to break it down, ang number, ang 1,600. We break down natin into uh, dependent sa risk. No? For example, ang isang group Diyan is LSI, OFW at saka balik probinsya. Pag bakita mo, sa 1,600, 1,008 are LSI's, OFW's. As I mentioned earlier, ever since to date, wala pa tayong case na ito sila dumating ng late at saka nakahawa ng taga rito. Wala tayong case na ganun. Ang next case is ang healthcare workers. We want to monitor ang healthcare, healthcare workers kasi sila ang nagahandle ng mga COVID cases. Eh. Special case lang to kasi... Every time, gusto rin natin malaman through testing ng mga healthcare workers kung uh, sufficient ba ang protocols ng mga hospitals at saka efficient ba ang implementation ng mga protocols na to. So, so far, wala pa rin tayong case na nagkahawaan sa mga hospital sa district and provincial hospitals. Wala tayo. Meron tayong mga positives doon pero hindi nila nakuha doon, kundi doon sa mga bahay nila. Ang pinakamedyo high risk dito yung mga close contacts kasi before natin malaman na positive sila, ilang araw muna sila pumapasok sa trabaho, siguro nag-birthday party, ilang beses siya pasok sa bahay, trabaho, bahay, trabaho, parang ganon. May mga kung saan-saan nagpunta, siguro nag-grocery, no? So kaya, bago natin malaman. Unlike sa LSI na pagdating, hindi yan tatapak sa bahay muna nila, diretso yan quarantine. So walang risk doon. So next natin, break down naman natin on a monthly basis. So pag nakita nyo dyan, total confirmed, no? Month, tapos ang rate natin, ang total swabs, at saka yung positivity rate. Sa total swabs, ilan ang nag-positive? So, yun yung nakikita nating rate. So, kung nakakikita natin, nung June, mataas tayo, 8.87%. Tapos, July, 3.2%. August, 79 September, 5.87%. So, kung tutusin, in terms of positivity rate, mas maganda ang September. Mas bumaba ang positivity
take place sa September. So, isang mga information na tinitingnan namin to. Tapos, we have the swabs ng results ng mga tatlong laboratories na nag-process sa atin. No? Next, ang recoveries, ang death, ang active cases. Kung tingnan nyo rin sa active cases, noong August, meron tayong nakarecover na lahat ng August. No? Yung September, meron pa tayong 213. Plus, October, meron tayong 72. So, meron tayong 285 active cases. So, ito naman yung by uh, LSI close contact. Kung sa close contact, medyo September was worse than ano, than August. Next, eh, medyo nakakaduling lang to na report yung mga by municipality. This is just an example, ha, yung August, no? If you look at yung isang ano natin, yung halimbawa yung palo, no? May mga top point of time na tumaas siya. Ang palo kasi katabi ng takloban to, eh. Tumaas, tapos bumaba na naman. Parang ganun lang yan. No? Ganun lang ang case. Minsan, meron tayo sa September naman, yung Barugo, tumaas din. And then, ngayong October naman, yung Hilugos, another town naman, tumataas, tapos bumababa. Which is good pa rin ang result, results. No? So, just to show, no, for example, ang next slide, yung ano natin, yung graph ng September. So, pag makita natin ang graph, medyo ano naman, yung red are the confirmed cases. Yung black, yung low risk, yung mga LSI. Ang binabantayan talaga natin ito yung close contact at saka yung yellow yung health workers. So pag tingin mo dito September 22 biglang tumaas. Ito yung may nangyari sa Barugo. No may isang index lang to. Kasi ito siya medyo hindi tayo na, na isolate kaagad kasi parang apor eh galing sa ibang lugar dumating. Tapos may mga kaibigan siya dito nag-inuman. Tapos umalis din. Nung pinuntahan niya doon na siya na swab. Tapos ininform na dito. So it was already several days, no? So nagkahawaan na. What is important here is sige, nandun na. na habol pa rin namin sa contact tracing and then eventually yung town na yan nag 00 na naman siya and then October medyo ang October medyo tumaas taas tayo ng konti no? pero konti pa lang data 3 days pa lang so hindi pa lang natin ang isang ano naman dito sa October isang town yung Hilongos medyo merong nagkahawaan doon the next day 00 na sila ang isa pang report na tinitingnan natin yung yung average daily cases natin so kung makita natin dito nung June we had an average of 1.4 a day. Actually, we have a daily average sa total confirmed. Pero kung tanggalin natin yung low, low risk, kasi ang minomonitor talaga namin yung high risk. Eh. Tanggalin natin yung LSI. Uh, halimbawa, sa, sa June, ang, ang average daily niya sa kun, total confirmed is 7. Pero pag ang close contact lang at saka healthcare worker ang iano mo dyan, lumalabas is 1.4 lang per day. Uh, kung sa mga high risk, no? tanggalin mo ang low risk. So, sa July, ang average daily niya is 5. Pero ang high risk niya, 7 lang eh. August, meron tayong, uh, kung ang high risk natin, ang total ng high risk niya is 168. Divide mo sa 31, then 5.4 ang average niya per day. No? September, tumaas siya ng 11.2. These are the, ano ha, these are the high risk. Tapos, pag October so far, eh, maaga pa naman to, hindi pala tatin maano. Pero so far, ang hinahawakan namin ditong numero is 17.3%. Medyo tumaas tayo pa sa October. Uh, anyway, kung tutusin, yun yung numbers. No? So, we're still looking at medyo mababa pa rin ang risk. Manageable pa rin. In control pa rin ang ating mga healthcare workers sa situation. In another note, ano, ang napapag-usapan natin lagi dito, no, yung general public welfare. Ironically, ang general public welfare eh, na may misinterpret na COVID-19 lang. Somebody asked me before, kung ako daw, anong priority ko? Yung health or yung economy? Sabi ko, both. I cannot choose. Hindi yan dapat pinagpipilian. We need to keep our economy strong. We need to keep people uh, fed. No? May pagkain ang tao, may trabaho ang tao as we control the virus. Meron namang solusyon. Mas mahirap lang. Diba? But it can be done. It has been done by other countries. With or without pandemic or a calamity, we have really have to look after the general public welfare no? ng ating mga constituents. The general welfare of our constituents. So, just like what happened sa amin sa Yolanda, no? more than the damage na nakita nyo yung massive damage sa property, massive damage sa agriculture, sa infrastructure, more than that, the biggest damage talaga was the damage done on our pe- people. How can we recover kung ganun ang situation ng tao? So, and the best way for us to recover is to snap people out of their shock. I-shift natin ang focus ng tao from their miseries to recovery, from bleeding to healing, from uh, being 
victims to be, being sub survivors. So from despair to hope, we had to find ways to snap people out of their shock. And as soon as 1.8 million Litenios woke up no, from their shock, tingnan nyo, to cut the long story short, in less than two years, we were able to fully recover. And from then on, we will build more resiliency sa tao. And to do that, ang ginamit namin dyan, yung late economics program, yung flagship natin, no? uh, build a competitive, inclusive, and resilient community economies. Based naman dun sa report ng NEDA, tumaas ang disposable income, average disposable income ng retenios. And then yung napansin din namin, hindi lang yung disposable income, tumaas. Yung number of people or yung percentage ng population natin na nagkaroon ng disposable income, dumami rin. So as a result, naging attractive siya sa mga investments. Marami nang pumasok ever since na mga malls, mga supermarkets, mga fast food chains. These are multinational companies ha? at saka mga Philippine stock exchange listed na mga companies. These are big companies investing in our municipalities. Na normally, ito sila, doon lang niya nag invest sa mga cities. May ranking pa nga na ginawa ang DOST sa eight, among 81 provinces ni rank na nila sa economic development, sa economy. From the top 20 poorest kami after Yolanda, no? now narang kami as 14th sa economy in uh, the entire country. On the last note, uh, gusto ko lang pasalamatan yung, yung organizer nitong forum na to, yung Center for Local and Regional Governance ng National College for Public Administration and Governance of the University of the Philippines. Uh, again, salamat sa pag-organize nito. I'm quite sure mga forums na ganito will really con contribute a lot no, sa development ng ating mga participants, improving their skills, how to build a better nation. Uh, kaya nga, malaking congratulations sa, sa activity na to. Para naman dun sa mga participants, your being here today uh, you know, just indicates na you want to be counted. Uh, you want to be part of the solution sa mga problema natin sa Pilipinas at saka lalo na ngayon na may pandemya. So again, a big thanks also sa inyo. I hope after this forum, we can join together and to build a better country and a better Philippines. So mabuhay ang kayong lahat, mabuhay ang sambayan ng Pilipinas. Maraming salamat po sa inyo lahat. Thank you very much, uh, Governor Mick. It was a very inspiring presentation. Again, you always wow me, and I know you for a long time already. And uh, Governor Mick, there were three exciting points you raised. One, I like when you were the philosophical view of how to beat the virus as to the rigid quarantine protocols that has to be observed. And thank you for doing that. Second, uh, the whole presentation, you were focusing on numbers, on data and a data-based approach, even the, uh, the infection rate of the front line, you try to put that in one graph, that was amazing. Just sending a message that we just have to be conscious of the evidences. And the third, thank you for saying that it's not an or, it's not health or economy, it's health and economy. And you always the model, Leite is always the model for resiliency. Thank you for uh, a beautiful, inspiring uh, presentation, Go. See you later for the open forum group. No, uh, we love sure. open forum after the two presenters. Thank you, Gold. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, let's proceed to our uh, next presenter from Leyte. Let's proceed to the province of Quirino. With us this afternoon is the national president of ULA, the Union of Local Authorities of the Philippines, and at the same time, the governor of the province of Quirino. Let us all welcome Governor. Dekila Dax Carlo Kua. Go. Go. Okay. Uh, um, Governor Kua, sir, you're on mute. Sign we unmute, sir. No, sir. Go for the docs. Um, 
Um, the governors are still on the meeting room. We're just trying to reach him. Naka-online naman siya, Mitch, no? Sigo? Yes, sir. Opo. Nasa meeting room po siya, sir. Let's just... Um... Excuse me? Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I apologize. Oh, it's okay. Go for it. Thank you for... Uh, um, under my uh, situation. <laughs> uh, let me begin uh, our experience here in Kirina. First, uh, if you will allow, I'd like to acknowledge and give due recognition to our other guests, um, Professor and Dean uh, Dan Sagil of the NCPAG UP Diliman, my alma mater, uh, Dr. Dixon Yasai, thank you again, Assistant Professor Alicia Celestino, Ms. Michelle Castillo, our moderator for the event, um, my colleagues in the ULAP, the President of the League of Vice Governors, of the Philippines, uh, Vice Governor Karen Nagapay. We also have Vice Governor Christine Garin, and we have Vice Governor Kimpo. I saw him earlier. Mayor Lavelle and you, na uh, unang presenter po natin. Governor Kadyao, my good friend, Governor Kakabagao, uh, napaka outstanding. One of the last remaining strongholds, na COVID free. And of course, uh, very hardworking and sincere. Public Servant Governor Dominico Petilla. Belated happy birthday, Governor Mick. Nag birthday po siya on October 6. To everyone who is now watching, ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant afternoon to all. Let me express my warm congratulations again to the League of Vice Governors of the Philippines and the Center for Local and Regional Governance in partnership with the UP National College of Public Administration and Governance. My profound gratitude and appreciation for inviting us to this activity. Faced with an unprecedented adversity, the local government units adopted their respective response measures appropriate to their efforts of the national governments. I am delighted that this acknowledges and features the best practice models exemplified by some LGUs, specifically those who actively pursued strategies and innovations in responding to the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. My presentation will focus on three items, a brief background about the province of Quirino, number two, the challenges we encountered during this pandemic, and number three, our response and strategies amidst this public health emergency crisis. So Quirino is a small province in region two or the Cagayan Valley region. It has six municipalities, 132 barangays. It is one of the most important headwaters of the Cagayan River Basin, which is regarded as the watershed haven. And if I may quote our dear Secretary Bello of the Dole, sabi po niya, and if you ask me, I agree, Quirino is the most beautiful province in Region 2. <laughs> Pasensya na po sa mga ka-region ko, ha? It is a third-class province with a small, relatively small land area of 3,000 square kilometers. Based on the 2015 statistics survey, our population is about 192,000, close to 200,000 people with 46,000 households. So 26, 2015 po yan, medyo nag-increase na po from then. Allow me to share with pride that our province is a consistent awardee of the seal of good housekeeping from 2010 to 2013 and the SGLG award since 2014 up to today. And the and for exhibiting excellence in disaster risk reduction and management, DRRM, and mainstreaming DRM in the development programs and initiatives, our province received the honor of being the best PDRRM council during the 21st Gawad Kalasag National Awards. For the dynamic, inclusive planning and capacity building to foster disaster resilient communities and promoting disaster preparedness and response at all levels, our province was accorded the prestigious National Gawad Kalasag Champion Award. With all our six municipalities declared as drug-free, our province is also recipient of the Seal of Drug Cleared Province. Our team Embrace was organized in the year of 2018 
to lead the rehabilitation and management of drug surrenderies. In promoting disaster preparedness and prevention, asensya na po ako medyo nag, uh, bab, nagbubuhat lang po ng konting bangko. Uh, that is not to say that that we are of this accomplishment. That, that is just to emphasize a point that Quirino is made up of a people that are that have a strong sense of community. Kaya na-achieve po namin yung mga ganyang accomplishments. In promoting disaster preparedness and prevention, we make use of geographical information system as an important tool in decision making and it provides accurate information in almost all aspects of planning. Ang lahat ng aming 132 barangays are equipped with hazard maps that highlight areas vulnerable to a particular hazard that aid our municipal government units to deliver accurate and timely warnings. Despite our limited resources, the provincial government has to depend on its primary asset, the culture of excellence embedded in public service. With deep commitment and dedication, we work with both passion and enthusiasm to deliver the best services our provincial government can provide to our constituents. And this has become our powerful tool during this health crisis. Given no lead time to prepare and to do the homework or the groundwork, with scarce resources to mobilize and limited capacity to handle localization of policies and programs, it would have been extremely difficult without this culture of genuine public service. Since the community quarantines were hoisted all over the country and our province has had five confirmed cases only since the onset of COVID-19, and currently we are COVID-19 disease-free. However, the proximity of the, our province to our adjacent provinces and cities um, continues to pose serious threat of transmission of the virus because of the significant number of COVID cases um, found in our adjacent communities. The repatriation of locally stranded individuals and returning overseas workers or ROFs is also a serious challenge considering that the spike in the number of suspected and confirmed cases in our region is generally attributed to the arrival of LSIs and OFWs. And this compelled our provincial government to exercise more vigilance. Now, there are four existing hospitals in our province, namely the Pro Provincial Medical Center, which is the main hub, and the Madela District Hospital, which, are, which is another smaller but still a level one hospital. Not equipped to handle COVID-19 severe and critical cases, while the Difun and Aglipay district hospitals are mere infirmaries. COVID-19 cases of the provinces are being brought to the care and attention of the Southern Isabella Medical Center, or SAMC, a level two DOH hospital located in the city of Santiago, right outside the province. None of the hospital labs in our province has DOH certification to conduct RT-PCR, the gold standard confirmatory test of COVID-19, and the nearest testing facility is in Tugigaro City. But pretty soon, SIMC or the one in Santiago City, DOH Hospital, will soon open its COVID-19 laboratory. A significant number of our population are with immunodeficiency or comorbidities or other health risks and who belong to the vulnerable group. Particularly during the early stage of the community quarantine, a considerable amount of residents have violated the mandatory wearing of face masks and the provincial government had to exert more stringent measures to ensure adherence to minimum health standards, foster physical and mental resilience in its residents, resilience of its residents, reduce exposure of individuals and provide assistance to vulnerable groups. Next, Paul, um, I would like to do, discuss our response to COVID-19. Upon knowing of the existence of the first COVID-19 case in the Philippines months before the lockdown, the provincial government through the PHO gathered all barangay officials and the members of the BHIR to orient them with, the, with regard to COVID-19 virus and accompanying guidelines and protocols. I remember specifically on February 10th, I think, I'm not sure about the 10th, but uh, Mid-February, we conducted a meeting of our DRRM and as early as then, even without the President's declaration of uh, health emergency, the province of Korea declared a 
state of preparedness against COVID-19. Actually, dalawa yon, COVID-19 and ASF ang minanage namin in, as early as February. The Barangays through the Barangay Health Emergency Response or BHERT and the Municipal Health Offices through the Municipal Epidemiological Response Units or the MESUs have been activated and specifically tasked to check if the residents of incoming locally stranded individuals and returning overseas Filipinos would qualify as quarantine facility. Adherence to the minimum health standards and observance of mandated DOH protocols and guidelines are fully and properly cascaded down to the municipal and barangay health levels. Equipping and inspiring them with the needed assistance and support, morale, and engaging their active involvement, the activation of the BHIRT proved to be extremely essential. Kaya nga talaga sobrang appreciation namin sa barangay workers. Extremely essential in preventing the spread of this COVID-19 disease. The provincial government, together with the DILG and the DOH, conducted training of trainers for contact tracers from our localities. These trainers eventually trained contact tracers from the various barangays in our six municipalities. So far, we have trained 864 tracers and has surpassed the required ratio in the propor and proportion to our population of approximately 200,000, the required number being 250 only. So four, halos four times na namin na doble yung, uh, more than three times na namin na, doble, na exceed yung requirement. Contact tracing and case investigation as core disease control dis measures have been key strategy and successful tools in containing the spread of COVID-19 in our province. Our BHIRT and MHOs had vigorously, vigorously collaborated with the five confirmed cases that we had and helped them recall everyone they had close contact with during the period and they could have been contagious when, when they could have been contagious. RT-PCR COVID-19 tests were promptly and efficiently conducted and suspected quarantined and monitored strictly and uh, regularly. If at all there is something unique in our communities, it is the ready watchfulness and vigilance of our kailians or our kababayans to volunteer information and their willingness to help that significantly contribute in stopping the chain of transmission. So again, I'd like to reiterate a strong sense of community has really served us well during these trying times. The Provincial Interagency Task Force developed a system called Q-TRIP or Quirino Traveling Residents Inbound to the Province aimed to facilitate the return of Quirinian locally stranded individuals and returning overseas Filipinos by providing free transportation services and other necessary assistance. From March 2020 until the present, the joint efforts of the provincial and municipal governments through Q-TRIP program have repatriated a total of 3,224 LSIs and 495 returning overseas Filipinos. Only the remaining 30 LSIs, kanina 11 na lang po, during the, this report was prepared 30, kanina 11 na lang po, are scheduled to be transported back to the province. Their arrival are closely coordinated with the MDRRMO, MHO, and BHERT. Quarantine facilities are prepared beforehand and rapid and or RT-PCR tests are promptly administered. In cases where there are no available quarantine space for an LSI or ROF, it has been customary for the family members, ito po isang unique practice namin dito sa Quirino, family members of the concerned LSI or ROF ang nakikibahay sa kanilang kamag-anak or kapitbahay to leave the person to be quarantined alone in their own home where they are warmly welcomed by their neighbors. This heroic sacrifice of our community, our Kailians, to save our communities from this deadly virus is a practice that even our good Secretary Anyo has commended. And as a best practice worthy to be shared with other local government units. Aware that our two provincial hospitals are mere level one hospitals and which primarily provide health care and treatment to our constituents. As a strategy, therefore, the provincial government of Quirino decided to establish a community isolation unit separate from the hospitals. Kasi ayaw po namin magkaroon ng risk na masyadong malapit yung isolation activity doon sa aming care for non-COVID patients. So, 
This ICU is designed to cater for asymptomatic and mild COVID-19 cases. This ensures that confirmed cases are not mingled with non-COVID-19 patients. Strong collaboration is forged in the bi-weekly meetings of the PDRRMC, IATF, and response clusters, where health protocols are discussed and solutions devised to overcome the hurdles encountered in the management of checkpoints, RHQs, and the quarantine facilities. The regular meetings rigorously conducted, regularly conducted have also become a platform for information dissemination of issuances both by the national and local governments. So dyan na rin po namin binababa, kinakaskade sa mga barangay officials yung ating mga uh, regulations from the DILG, from the IATF, at dyan na rin nagre-report sa Price Watch. Uh, Price Council is also reporting there twice a week. To uphold community health and safety control, border checkpoints were organized initially in 15 primary and secondary roads and currently less sent down to seven major borders in the province to manage the entry and exit of persons and vehicles. Personnel from the PNP, AFP, BFP, PDRRMO, and MDRRMOs are deployed and jointly helping one another in manning these checkpoints. All persons arriving at any point of entry within the province are required to fill up a health declaration and contact information form para po sa contact tracing, which are all recorded in a logbook. A daily summary of all arriving persons and vehicles are prepared by the PNP personnel and copy furnished the PHO or Provincial Health Office for study and analysis. So we will mine this data no, para makita namin is the trend increasing. Do we need to tweak the policies? To boost their efforts in inspecting people passing through the checkpoints, PPEs are regularly distributed and meal subsistence allowance provided in all our checkpoints. The effective inspection conducted at checkpoints has also proven to be one of the province's formidable tools in preventing the transmission of the disease into Quirino. To step up our efforts to protect the health of the most vulnerable in our community, the provincial government distributed relief goods and vitamins. And to ensure that our residents would have access to food, we made available meat, poultry, and fresh harvest right at their doorsteps at affordable prices through our program called the Mobile Palenque. Quirino's response to COVID-19 has involved significant community cooperation. The inclusive partnership with all the municipal, local government units, national government agencies, private sector, and stakeholders jointly leverage our strengths toward a common solution. We have been stronger and more effective working together, proactively engaging stakeholders, aligning and coordinating our efforts. To end, I am proud to say that the province of Quirino has exemplified community united in action, and we will continue to harness this unity and teamwork and our efforts to build a better Quirino and a brighter future for our children during this pandemic and even beyond. Marami salamat po and stay safe. Thank you. Marami salamat po, Governor Dax, and thank you for leading all the local government units in the country today in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, highlighting three points, a very inspiring story. One, you keep on saying about the Gawad, Gawad Akalasag uh, Award that you received, but you said it's not about the award, it's about the strong sense of community impact. In fact, there was this practice only in Quirino that if the house is not qualified for home quarantine, the relatives and neighbors would offer that. That is something that uh, we should share to the rest of the archipelago. Second, uh, you were saying about the GIS as a tool to, uh, tool for, to support decision making. I think that's something that LGUs must adapt you now using really data. And third, thank you for going to the barangays, um, educating the barangay officials and uh, training the BHERTS. And thank you for the cute trip program that you have. Thank you, Governor Dax. See you later for the open forum, Governor Dax. Thank you. Salamat po. And then our next, the last but not the least resource person. I hope he's already around. and. Uh, we are so glad that uh, this afternoon we'll be joined by the Honorable Mayor of Baguio City. And uh, he has been traveling around the country trying to help different cities. I had a chance to listen to his uh, uh, talk in Cagayan de Oro through my friends. Let us all welcome the City Mayor of Baguio, Mayor Benjamin Magalong. Mayor? Thank you, Governor Dax. Good 
Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you very much uh, to our participants. And uh, thank you, uh, organizers, for having us and uh, allowing us to join this uh, webinar. Uh, please allow me to share my screen. Kita na ba yung presentation po namin? Yes po. Ma, we can see the ready. Thank you po. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to... Okay. Okay. Uh, let me just give you an overview of, you know, all about Baguio. Uh, first of all, it's, uh, it fits, it, as I an area of about 57 square kilometers. It is uh, 1,540 miles above sea level. That's about 5,000. Our total population is 345,000. Uh, in 2015, in 2019, when we extrapolated it, it's about uh, 371,000. But our floating population is at about 580,000. And uh, our looking at our population density, it's about 6,386 persons per square kilometer. And just to let you know about our value added attractions, we are the major tourist destination in, uh, in uh, Luzon. We are the prime education center of Northern Luzon. We're the center of health and wellness at the same time, the center for trade and industry. The seat of national government offices is actually based in, for the entire country region is based in the city of Baguio. And we are just one of the two cities that were recognized by UNESCO as the greatest city for crafts and arts. In fact, um, Cebu is the second uh, city that was recognized by UNESCO. Just would like to inform you about the status of cases in the city as of October 6. Uh, we have a total of 1,167. And if you look at the data that we're presenting right now, we have a very high number of active cases, 593. And that's because of two outbreaks that happened here three weeks ago. We have a group of butchers uh, who got infected because uh, they were, you know, butchers. They keep on, uh, you know, they have the habit of drinking uh, almost every day. Kinakadami yung pulutan, nakalagay lang yung mga pulutan. Ang masama nun is hindi naman sila nag-o-observe yung tinatawag natin KKB. Ginagawa nila, nagpapasaan ng baso, pati yung pulutan. They share the same utensils. So around 64 out of 160 butchers were uh, got infected. That basically closed down the entire barangay. And when we started going over and you know doing the contact tracing, alaman namin around 200 plus pa ang infected, including their household and the other barangays as a result of that um, outbreak in in uh, the slaughterhouse. Second is the outbreak uh, among the, uh, the police trainees. Out of the 200, around 123 were infected. And uh, it was just a result of a one particular guy, uh, a supervisor who came from the other province to Matinsia. In fact, initially, about 16 uh, trainees and then Dumami and Dumami. The good news is we have already contained all these outbreaks. So uh, our cases are now going down. We even went up to 77 you know, cases. And if you look at our contact tracing uh, data, Almost the total number of cases of what 1,167 of that number, 73% was a result of contact tracing and 22% was a result of expanded testing. So let me now go. Uh, every time we uh, we uh, uh, pass some uh, policies, rules, regulations, or ordinances, we make sure that we. Um, in, uh, engage the impacted sector that's part of our crisis communication. And in fact, uh, as of this date, we have a total of 37 engagements that were already conducted with the different uh, sectors, and we call this the community engagement uh, efforts of the city of Baguio. Now there is a work on contact tracing. Uh, to, uh, I believe everybody is uh, quite aware that we were able to introduce a new type of contact tracing and is now being implemented nationwide. Uh, one is uh, uh, we have introduced several innovations. We have restructured the regional organization, uh, starting from team leaders to, you know, it's a military organization. This time we call it the contact tracing ecosystem. We, in, we introduced uh, interviewers, uh, analysts, we introduced uh, 
um, uh, technical support groups because you look at the contact tracing is very similar to investigation and you have to deal with big data and you have to analyze big data and uh, you, the human mind, the human brain cannot process big data. You need technology to process it. And those are also some of the innovations that we have introduced in contact tracing. If you look at the contact tracing, we have these uh, different types of uh, tools that we introduced. Uh, we have the data collection tool, the GIS platform, and the link analysis. These are the tools that we're using now to be able to really uh, analyze our big data in, uh, uh, in contact tracing. And these are the same concepts now that we are introducing to the other local government units, part of the capacity building to be able to increase their contact tracing efficiency ratio from the original one is to three. We started with one is to three nationwide. Now our average is one is to eight uh, nationwide. Uh, we continue also to conduct uh, expanded mass and targeted, uh, you know, uh, sectoral testing. In fact, uh, uh, for the past uh, two months, uh, we conducted about 4,000 uh, uh, mass testing in the entire city of Baguio. And now we're doing another mass testing. We're in, uh, for the next three days, we will be conducting 1,000 uh, tests per day, uh, targeting uh, sectors that were uh, regularly exposed and the possibility of uh, getting infected with the uh, coronavirus is, is high. Um, about, uh, about two months after the start of the pandemic, uh, everyone, almost all the local government units are wanting in, in test kits. And uh, to be able to, you know, to accept that, what we did was to adopt artificial intelligence technology, we start with the CT scan technology wherein we will be able to determine and detect possible COVID-19 cases in a matter of nine minutes. And we used Huawei technology to do that. Just recently, about two weeks ago, we are now introducing another type of technology and that's the AI X-ray technology. And we're now working closely with the Japanese company NTT. And the research is now being conducted here. Almost 100, 1,000 people uh, will be targeted as a, as, a, as a sample size and we are now at the range of about 700 people and uh, you'll be amazed on this type of technology. It can detect uh, potential, potential COVID-19 uh, patients or cases in a matter of two minutes. You know? And one thing about this uh, AI X-ray technology is that you know, it can detect other, other uh, diseases that uh, affects the lungs, uh, 17 total diseases, including uh, mar uh, cardiomegaly, pati fibrosis, pneumonia, tuberculosis, and dami po niya, including cancer, uh, and dami po niya. Kaya marami pong nakikinabang ngayon dito sa AI technology na ito. Another is the uh, uh, antigen pilot testing, because since we introduced the antigen uh, about uh, a month, more than a month ago, um, NTF and IATF took cognizance of this, and just to determine the efficacy of this antigen pilot test, they decided that Baguio City will be the pilot area for the uh, rapid antigen test. Hopefully, uh, we're almost done with the, uh, with the uh, ongoing study, and hopefully uh, uh, we'll be able to submit all the results within the week, and then next week, you know, DOH, uh, HTAC will be able to um, release uh, the omnibus guidelines in the use of antigen uh, uh, tests for the entire country. Um, one of the issues that we're facing, especially in containing, is how do we deal with uh, residents that are coming back to the city of Baguio? And this was one of our predicaments about five months ago when we allowed uh, LSIs and you know other uh, travelers with essential travel to come into the city of Baguio. So what we came up is uh, we came up with a system uh, that would process in Baguio residents. Hence, lahat na pumapasok ko sa Baguio, either you're a Baguio resident or a visitor with essential travel, everyone has to, has to uh, pre-register to do sa aming HDF at baguio.gov.ph. Pagdating nyo rito, meron na ko kayo mga, magkakaroon na ko kayo ng mga um, QR codes so that when you go to our triage, madali lang ko yung process. You don't have really to wait for about uh, more than an hour to be processed. Um, we have two central triage in the city of Baguio, and you will be 
surprised how clean, organized, and uh, you will be amazed. Uh, you will like our uh, magugustahin nyo po yung mga triage center and we're getting a lot of compliments from our visitors, even from our VIPs who come up to the city of Baguio. Uh, for our tourists, since uh, we opened up our tourism industry last October 1, uh, this part of our recovery, recovery and resiliency plan, uh, we developed this, uh, this system, the VISITA, you know, Visitors Information Travel Assistance. Nandiyan na lang ho, lahat po ng turista na gustong pumunta sa Baguio, all you have to do is pre-register din po dito sa aming system na to so that um, you'll be able to, you know, uh, uh, enjoy your stay in the city of Baguio. At the same time, there will be no hassles in traveling to the city of Baguio. Unfortunately, we're only limiting it to the people of Region 1 Muna. The reason for that is we would like to learn from it. It is a, you know, a learning curve for everyone, uh, for us uh, in local government. And then once uh, we experience it, uh, we'll be able to learn how to manage our tourists. And that's the only time if our confidence level goes up that we are capable of managing a uh, huge number of tourists and that's the time that we're going to open up to the other regions like NCR, Visayas, and Mindanao. Oh, ito naman po yung aming triage center. Pero ito po eh, kinolapse na po namin to. This is the old triage center and we have uh, two new triage uh, facility now in the city of Baguio. And one triage facility for all OFWs. Our city public market is one of the highlights of, uh, you know, uh, one of the most uh, visited uh, part of the city. And uh, in fact, uh, this is now subject to a uh, market development plan. We're now working with uh, uh, two companies that have uh, submitted their unsolicited proposal. But despite the, uh, the present status of our public market, you can find out because we're getting a lot also of uh, compliment from uh, our visitor that is a very clean public market, very orderly, and our public markets are being uh, cleaned uh, almost uh, twice a week po, to make sure that uh, these are disinfected properly and people are, um, are uh, you know, uh, will, uh, will feel safe going to the city market because um, it is something that, uh, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's uh, virus free and and uh, they know that, you know, uh, they know that they're in a good, uh, you know, clean and uh, safe part of the city. I just would like also to inform you that we're still using our market pass at the moment. Yung mga taga barangay ho, they only go, they're only given a chance to go to the city three times a week. But anytime soon, uh, we will cancel all the market pass so that uh, we will now allow uh, our residents and at the same time our visitors to visit regularly our market, paski na daily na po because we have already put in place uh, certain uh, systems and certain uh, you know, protocol in the city market. And uh, our uh, relief operations is basically centralized. We're using, uh, again, technology to, you know, to um, manage our uh, relief operations from the, uh, you know, from the acceptance of donation to the distribution process. Again, this is uh, being managed with the use of, uh, you know, uh, certain type of technology that uh, that basically um, accounts for all these, uh, you know, for all these uh, food packs and other all the other essential items that we distribute to our indigents. Um, one of the one of the main issues that we're receiving, uh, especially from our frontliners, and uh, is the uh, is the uh, stress the level of stress that they are experiencing. And that's why we have a stress debriefing activity that we, we uh, you know, we conduct regularly with our frontliners. Mataas na po. Uh, even our contact tracers, uh, they are getting a lot of, uh, you know, they're getting uh, a lot of exposure to, to uh, stress. Uh, that's why, uh, you know, we partnered with a private uh, or private groups who are willing to, you know, render the service for free para po matulungan din sila how to cope up with stress kasi napataka, napakataas na rin po. Another is the survival garden and our survival garden actually uh, when we posted this in Facebook it has uh, it has uh, you know, um, uh, generated around um, more than 2 million likes uh, because uh, you know uh, one thing about the city of Baguio is it's uh, it's a place where you see a lot of different types of plants and flowers and uh, fruits for Rito. 
Sorry to po yung mga ating isa sa mga ginawa po namin. We conducted a, a competition among the barangays and, uh, you know, we continue to sustain it. And uh, the good news is the Department of Agriculture provides a lot of uh, support in terms of seeds and at the same time, pati na rin po yung, uh, yung uh, financial support to, to our uh, residents who are engaged in survival gardening. Now, to prop up the economy, um, the city of Baguio allotted around 100 million pesos for our MSMEs. But then later on, we found out that uh, we can only support yung uh, micro and small. Dahil yung mga medium, eh, karamihan ho dyan, mga, mga Jollibee, mga McDonald's, nakasama ho pala sa medium. So we decided to focus only on micro and small enterprises. And it's not enough. 100 million is not enough. It can only support around 30% of our total MSMEs. And to be able to make sure that we will have a sort of a return of investment, we partnered with DTI. We partnered with the Small, uh, small Business Corporation for the screening process. Um, I would like to inform you that early 2000, nagkaroon din ho ng stimulus package. Unfortunately, not a single centavo came back, uh, got back to the coffers of uh, government, local government. And the reason for that is yung po yun, yung political intervention. Karamihan po na mga pinili doon, eh, puro, puro pinili po ng mga politiko. That did not happen during this, uh, you know, during this uh, uh, stimulus package. Sinigurado po namin, wala pong police, uh, political intervention. Now, this is uh, something that we are really proud of, this digital transformation. And I would like to inform you that the city of Baguio will start the construction of our smart city system. Um, tapos na po ay yung uh, bidding, so the, the construction will start anytime next week. You know, it's a 200 million uh, project, and I would like to thank the president for helping us uh, support this project. Siya po ang nagpundo nito. And uh, it basically covers all the uh, smart city systems. So it has a smart city platform that will support smart economy, smart living, smart mobility, smart traffic, smart agriculture, smart economy, smart environment. In fact, when uh, the national, uh, when uh, the Australian government uh, got hold of this information, immediately they got in touch with us through ADB. And they are giving us a grant of about uh, almost uh, 3 million, uh, 3 million uh, pesos to support our, our, um, to support our uh, flood monitoring information and mitigation system. And at the same time, another company came up to Baguio to donate ito mga micro, micro uh, sensors for us to serve as our weather stations. Nagbigay po sila ng apat to cover the entire city of Baguio. It's time we don't have to really rely on Pag-asa for our weather uh, reports and for our weather forecast. We already have our own system. At the same time, we are also going to put up our um, data center. And at the same time, we could be the first uh, uh, LGU-led uh, broadband network. So two weeks ago, Maket po si Secretary Onasan dito. And we signed an agreement that we will now, the local government unit, will now pursue a 1 billion um, city band, uh, broadband network. It will be the first in the country. Uh, I just also, also would like to inform everyone that we are now pursuing a cashless and contactless payment, hopefully before the end of the, uh, this year or early part of next year. Lat na po ng transaction dito sa Ciudad ng Baguio will be cashless and contactless. And that system basically integrates pati na rin ho yung contact tracing namin, yung amin po cashless and contactless system, pati ho yung business process, pati ho yung, uh, ano ho to, yung uh, aming uh, uh, Baguio ID. This will all be integrated so that you will only be using one particular QR code para ho sa lahat ng sistema po na ginagagawin po natin. So what were the lessons learned uh, during this pandemic? Uh, I would just would like to emphasize on three aspects. We have eight, I spelled out uh, eight, uh, eight uh, lessons learned, but I would like to emphasize on three aspects only. One is leadership, you know? leadership. You know? 
you know, you'll be having and during this pandemic uh, leaders, especially local chief executives, will be doing and delivering a lot of, you know, unpopular decisions. But what is important is as long as it is something that you believe is right, never hesitate to come up with a decision. There will always be a lot of unpopular decisions that will be made during this pandemic. Just stick to it as long as you believe that you are right. Another is good, good governance. Alam niyo po, kami, the victim po kami nito. Good governance and transparency. You know, uh, I heard that some, uh, some uh, you know, local governments you know, took this opportunity, especially leaders, political leaders who took the opportunity to enrich themselves during this pandemic, you know, selling, uh, personally getting involved in, uh, in uh, supplying uh, medical equipment, medical items to the local government unit at a staggering cost. Uh, this is something that we cannot tolerate in the city of Baguio. You know? uh, zero tolerance po kami sa corruption dito. Dapat po dito walang SOP, dapat walang under the table arrangement. Everything should be very transparent. We emphasize here accountability. Uh, I learned uh, one particular in one particular uh, you know uh, report that we followed it up and then uh, we got all this. We conducted an investigation. May mga local government units sa ibang lugar na bumili ng gulay dito, 120,000 per truck. Pagdating doon, nagulat na lang kami na ang ang resibo na binigay sa local government is 900,000 pesos. So can you just imagine the corruption? You know? So that you know, they see that opportunity to enrich, enrich themselves and take advantage of uh, this pandemic. I believe, I believe that is not the right thing to do. And finally, look at number eight. COVID-19 pandemic is, is a challenge. It's always a challenge for, for, to all of us, especially to local uh, government. But it is also an opportunity for us to innovate and to adapt with the new normal. What is this? What is this all about? You know. This gave us an opportunity to improve our air quality. Uh, during the time that, uh, you know, two, two years ago, we have one of the worst air quality in the Philippines. In fact, we're number three to uh, you know, Manila and Cebu City. So what we did was uh, during this pandemic, we immediately, uh, during our last year, by the way, we were uh, working closely with the United Nations Development Program to develop our uh, you know, carbon emission uh, strategy uh, programs for carbon emission uh, reduction that gave us this opportunity with this pandemic to implement it dapat implement pa yan next year pero what we did to implement it as soon as possible we implemented our local transport re uh, rerouting uh, uh, local transport rerouting plan at ang ganda po ng resulta niya uh, significant po yung pagbaba ng uh, carbon emission namin and at the same time it gave us also the opportunity to pursue our smart city system and this will be coming a reality in after eight months. So these are the opportunities that we saw. And we are also working closely with our, um, some uh, members of the private sector on our waste to energy, our, our uh, integrated transport terminal, the, uh, the building of uh, you know, uh, our walkable city program. And we saw that, this opportunity during this pandemic. And we are pursuing all of this aggressively, aggressively. And again, we continue to stick to good governance. Maraming maraming salamat po. Thank you. Wow, thank you very much, Mayor Benji. Um, we have been following your, uh, the way you're running Baguio CP, no? I think for the last five months, we always hear your name and this afternoon we're able to listen directly from you, how you transform Baguio. And you're right, your, your last statement is about the opportunity the pandemic is bringing to us. And um, what was so exciting in your sharing was you were able to accelerate Baguio City becoming a smart city out of the pandemic with the AI technology. And thank you also for um, developing the contact tracing strategy or ecosystem. And you are really using the digital technology right now to combat COVID. I think you are the model of the country and we want to learn more from you. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Benji. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we'll have the open forum after the reaction of Vice uh, Governor Guerrero. Thank you, Mayor. At this point in time, uh, before we do our open forum, we would like to hear the reaction 
from the Vice Governor of Iloilo Province. Let us all welcome Honorable Christine Is Green. Vice? Hi, good afternoon. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, Vice, we can hear you. Okay, yes. Uh, okay, just let me. Okay, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Yasai, no? Thank you for. Just adjusting my screens here. Okay. Yes, again, no? salamat po kay Dr. Dixon Yasai, who was also a former mayor as well. Nakasama ko before uh, when I was mayor. Uh, of course, thank you sa lahat ng speakers natin. Uh, from kay Mayor Lovell, from Alang Alang, kay Gov Kaka, kay Gov Dax, kay Gov Nick Petilia, and of course, kay Mayor who just spoke right now, kay Mayor Magalong. And I also like to thank uh, yung Vice President namin, the Vice Governors League, kay Vice Gov Karen Agapay. No, I am Vice Governor Christine Tingting Garin of the province of Iloilo. And it is indeed an honor and a privilege and a welcome opportunity to be your reactor ngayong araw na to sa webinar. Now, indeed, we need to rise to the challenges of the pandemic that has changed lives, changed our governments, and brought us to a new normal. Indeed, more than ever, we need to pull our resources together and continue to cohesively work with each other. Now, after hearing all of your reports and knowing your respective locality situations, all the more no, that we need to hear each other out. All the more that we need best practices in managing this COVID pandemic. I will start with my reaction and later on I'll just have a very short presentation with regards to legislative response of the province of Iloilo. So the first um, reaction to Mayor Devel Anu, it is very clear that uh, how all our resources, with all the resources that are available to us, that at the end of the May, of the day in the midst of this crisis or any crisis for that matter, it is still our human resources that will spell a big difference. No, katulad niya, we had our exodus of OFWs, of OSIs, nagka-problema sila ng PCR lab kasi wala nga doon. They had to send samples in Cebu, in another province. Uh, they had to set up quarantine facilities and they also made use of technology in running their local government affairs to minimize transmission and contagion. But what our good mayor shared and recognized that upon setting up the quarantine facilities, there is more needed. Hindi lang physical, hindi lang facility. Pero important is the capacity. The capacity is the main issue. The guidelines in running those facilities to detail is a main issue. The capability of the people running these facilities is an equally main issue. Uh, mayor, you also shared no, that time was very crucial. And they knew that, especially when they had to uh, trace the nine positives in one barangay. After contact tracing after the nine positives in one barangay. Where time, like the spread of the virus, is very essential in everything that we do in managing this health emergency. The town of Alang-Alang certainly reminds us of that. We need to enhance, as we learned, we need to enhance our connectivity, literally and figuratively speaking. And also we hope, no, as Mayor Lovell Anu, that uh, the statistics will remain low on the infected and high on the recoveries. That as for data, I gathered Alang Alang has an 85.9 case recovery rate, which is worth emulating. Um, in the province of Leyte, it is noteworthy how in similar situations of cases and recoveries that is true to all of us in our localities. Uh, kay Governor Nick Petilia, who remains focused on the needs to protect its economy. Indeed, it is a constant battle between, always, between health and economy. Together, hearing us all here, we can come up with the best practices that works and is the solution needed to hear both. A healthy populace and a healthy economy. Gov Patilia is strong on the prevention, on winning the war against the virus, and I see, and I see the wisdom in that one. Sa kay Gov Kaka naman sa Dinagat Island. Here we learn so much from them being an island province. Governor Kaka, you may be one of the country's poorest provinces, but there is nothing, certainly nothing poor in your COVID-19 management, as you have presented. No, sorry, since the first case you had in January, it's been almost seven months na COVID-free kayo. 
to date, uh, you have no community transmission and all active cases were asymptomatic. Uh, and of course, your fear is valid na wala kayong hospital. And your doctor-patient ratio is nearly 8,000, which is very low, way below the World Health Organization na the average. So how do we become part of the solution to the problem faced with the Nugget Island? I ask this because the very answer to Tudangat's problem is the very answer to our own problems. And thus far, we look and learn from their solutions. Wala asilang construction of quarantine facilities. What do they do? Right. They have to be created. So the schools and evacuation centers and gymnasiums, they are able to have access to proper testing. Quarantine is taken seriously, much more seriously than others that I know of. And that in any all public emergencies, it should be help and work to have strategies in place and actions, plans that are anchored and experts. As in the case of COVID-19 restrictions, employed in keeping with health protocols proved to be a great call for the province. For, okay, for Doc Kuwa naman, okay, GovDax, he showed us the importance of rallying, of support, of public support for the community. A community united in action, thus them becoming a part of the solution to the problem that is COVID-19. We certainly can learn from the gains of Quirino Province, institutionalized 24-7 disaster preparedness and response plan. And what foresight and planning can best do in times of crisis with GovDocs GIS database for the province in place. Responsiveness of all these efforts are evident because while Quirino, like the rest of the country and the world, is facing up to COVID-19, their control measures are the mitigating measures. Talagang gawad galasag awarding And may also make mention of their social protection in place. Again, we heard the good governor stress the importance of this assistance to be as responsive and inclusive and increasing in order to best help out the more vulnerable in our city. And for Mayor Magalong, Thank you for giving us a fresh perspective of their crisis management and pandemic efforts. Special mention, as uh, of course, uh, Mayor Yasai also mentioned, yung contract tracing ninyo, it is very worth emulating. We hope we could also follow that here in our province, which uh, this, and also your ID system, po. it has raised efficiency rate and used as a model by our neighboring LGUs. Uh, Mayor Magaling is right in stressing the importance of being proactive in our respect approaches using whatever technology is available to us. The same concerns on surge of new cases in Baguio City that paved the way for the putting up of more isolation beds. I take note how uh, the return of OFWs and LSI strengthened the city's call for strict compliance of the very basic in health protocols. As lockdowns were ordered came the message to work as one and heal as one. This easily is translated into the capability, as you can see, and the capacity of Mayor Ben Magalo. So now, I go back to the province of Iliilo. I'll just show you, I'll just share to you the slides. Okay, can you see the slides, ba? Hindi pa po. Please go. Okay, just a Just wait. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, wait, ba. Um, uh, wait, wait, wait. Okay. Can you see it now? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, yeah. So, um, going back to the province of Iloilo. Now, um, just as background, the province of Iloilo is a first-class province. Population namin in 2015 was about 1.9. I think it's now about 2.1 million. Uh, we have 42 municipalities and one component city, the city of Pasi. Our number of barangays is 1,721, which I believe is the most number of barangays for any other province in the country. Now, in the province of Iloilo, uh, it, province of Iloilo is within Western Visayas region. And again, sadly, makita natin there on the lower left-hand corner, uh, one of the top five regions with the most number of COVID-19 cases. Our latest statistics based on active cases at 256 and sadly 44 deaths as of today. Uh, Western Visayas is home to the country's fourth largest group of overseas Filipino workers in the Philippines. We have been under general quarantine and dami no, iba ibang quarantine now together with, uh, we have the same classification with our co-provinces in Antigua, Capisa, Clan, and the island province of Kimaras. Now, our So what have we done to date? To date, we have passed the 13th Sanguni Ampan Lawigan, have passed a total of 11 new normal ordinances related to COVID-19. Makita natin, the first four here are all mandating the compliances to basic health protocols. We have the mandatory wearing of face masks, the face shield, the face dancing, and the hand washing. Next one, we have uh, ordinance protecting our frontliners and COVID patients against all forms of harassment, shaming, and discrimination. And the next one, we have an ordinance against uh, penalizing fake news and willful distribution. We also have an ordinance penalizing the dishonesty or untruthful declaration of any patient. We also have an ordinance implementing curfew hours in the entire province which is at starts at 9 p.m. to 4 o'clock in the morning, and also an ordinance prohibiting the hoarding, profiteering, and cartel of basic goods and essential commodities in malls, markets, and stores. And more, an ordinance regulating the, of course, regulating the sale of liquor. And we also have a provincial quarantine ordinance of 2020. And uh, soon we will be passing an ordinance implementing the expanded micro business recovery assistance during times of crisis and emergency. These are for our OFWs. And soon we will also be having the codification of new normal ordinances. So what was our objectives here? Our objectives was to guide our LGUs in planning, establishing and maintaining designated isolation or quarantine units. We also have uh, to guide our LGUs, their instrumentalities in constituent households and individuals, to streamline identification, admission, management, and referral protocols for contacts, of course, suspect, probable, confirmed cases of COVID-19, and to guide our health workers in assisting individual households. So those were our objectives. Next, we have, as far as the support to the executive, all COVID-19 related items of the executive plans of the governor needing legislative actions were duly acted by the provincial board. The governor led the province in crafting its rehabilitation and recovery strategy plan. These were mainly focused and prioritized on agriculture, tourism, and public transportation. Just a background, losses were incurred at about 10 billion for the province. Uh, we have other losses in tourism at 1.1, business and trade 4.8, and the agriculture sector at 103 million. So transportation demand losses were about 59.8 million for chimneys and 44.6 for buses. We have not even counted the losses for sea and air transport. And of course, one great loss also is for our formal, which was uh, formal and informal workers affected were around, I think it will be close to 400,000 by now, which translated to about 2.4 billion in losses in employment, as well as 
for the PWH, 117 na nga yung projects, but affected more than 5 million workers, as well as 2 billion from our BPO. So these are our losses po. So altogether, a picture, this reminds us not that this is not the time for politics and this is the time for policies. That even in the most basic in border restrictions that we order or not, we are mindful of its impact on local and regional economy. That in the decision to call for lockdowns, we need to be mindful of its impact on the survival of the families and our economy. And finally, and that all in this, we go back to the call for us not only to heal as one, but recover as one, which brings me back to this last matter, a best practice that we have in one of our districts in Southern Iloilo Health Zone. This is um, where seven towns came together and donated an automated RT-PCR machine in our laboratory, in the Western Research Medical Center Subnational Laboratory. So this increased the results Usually, we had results were about 7 to 14 days. Eh. So now, this increased results in about 3, you know, 2 to 3 or 5 days long, so which was really, really very fast. No? And starting this week, they will be conducting a full target mass testing that is about 5 individuals, no? 5 swabs in one kit lang. So our LGU makakasave sa resources nila financially. And they also donated test kits and automated machine for pool testing to the best besides uh, subnational laboratory. Just a note po, uh, the congresswoman here is Congresswoman Janet Garin, which is the former Secretary of Health. And for up to now, as of today, uh, this made possible the testing of about 50, more than 15,000 essential and non-essential workers, mostly from the first district or that is the Southern Iloilo. So again, madami, madamong lagid ka salamat. Again, thank you very much for UPCLRG and of course to the LVGP. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. And Madam Ogisama, pa yung hapon yun. Thank you. Yay! Thank you very much, Vice <laughs> Governor Christine Marami. It's already 3.36 and we have been listening for more than two hours and science would tell us that sitting down for almost yes. three hours is like smoking. And we have been using our brain, you know, listening to a very beautiful presentation it's okay, I'll invite you for a 15 second laughter exercise. <laughs> Have you tried laughing with no reason? Uh, as mentioned by Mitch, I am a laughter yoga teacher. I went to India just to study laughter yoga. <laughs> and uh, laughter is the best medicine. There's a study in the US in the 1980s. Our body cannot detect a fake laughter from a real one. It's okay to fake laughter. And why do we need to laugh? Because we want to produce endorphins, by the way. Mayor Benji was saying about the psychosocial thing. So the health right now is not just the physical health, but the emotional health. So just fake laughter, laugh aloud. Okay, I want to invite all of you, just sit down and then laugh for 15 seconds. That's equivalent to a five minute heavy physical exercise according to a London study. One, two, ready, go. <laughs> It was just an exercise for a 15 second of laughter. Now let's proceed to the open forum. Uh, what CLRG did, they gathered some questions prior to the uh, forum. And there are several questions here right now. What will I do as a moderator? I will raise a question for the speakers, but I will only ask two uh, resource persons to respond because we want to ensure that all of you will have the chance to uh, provide your answers. There are around seven, if we can still manage time, seven questions before we end uh, our forum this afternoon. So um, I'll raise the question and I'll uh, ask two resource persons to respond. Okay? Sige. So um, first question I'd like to ask um, maybe Mayor Benji and uh, Governor Mick Pitilia. Mayor Benji and Mayor Mick, are you around? I hope you're still here. 
The question is about management approach, you know, the crisis management. Um, this is a question, uh, there are related questions here, but uh, let me read the question of uh, Sir Aris Gutierrez, the assistant department head of uh, Quezon City, I think it's Quezon City, um, the RMO. The question, uh, Mayor Benji and Governor Mick, considering that there's still no end in sight for this pandemic, do you think that LGUs can still sustain being in crisis mode for another six months or one year? What adjustments do you think are needed to be undertaken to enable local government units to meet the challenges being encountered in this pandemic? So basically, this is about the crisis mode. How do LGUs should manage now, given that uh, there is no immediate uh, cure right now? So the question is about uh, the crisis mode. No? So do you consider there's still no end in sight for this pandemic? Do you think LGUs can still sustain being in crisis mode for another six months to one year? What adjustments do you think are needed to be undertaken to enable LGUs to meet the challenges being encountered in this pandemic? Uh, Mayor Benji, maybe you wanna reply first, respond first, Mayor Benji? Yes, Mayor Benji, please. Uh, Paki-unmute, Mayor Benji, paki-unmute. Governor Dax, mauna na po ako kasi tendency ko baka mangopia ako ng sagot. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, there's no choice, uh, Dixon. We have no choice but, you know, to manage it. And we have to assume it, assume the worst scenario to be able to come up with a good uh, crisis management program. You know? First is, we have to assume also that it will never end till uh, till uh, it will not uh, be over until 2021. That should be the assumption. So what are the needs? That, uh, what are our needs now? First is uh, we have to follow your principle of reserve. We make sure that we have still have enough funds to support our programs, our COVID-19 programs. Um, we have to make sure that, uh, you know, we manage our costs. Hindi pwedeng ibubuhos na lang natin kagad lahat-lahat. You know? um, we should understand that there's a big... Uh, a significant reduction in our revenue. We're expecting a loss of about 400 million this year and probably higher next year. Mabuti na lang tataas yung tira natin and probably dahil nagtaas kami ng konti ng aming uh, RPT, it will offset our loss, but it's still a big loss. So again, uh, it's, it's cost management. Uh, that is one of the uh, most important uh, you know, uh, aspect of uh, uh, crisis management. Second is uh, leadership. Uh, leadership at all levels, independent uh, leaders lang and be surrounded by the jokers. You have to make sure that you are surrounded by leaders. And, uh, you know, you have to develop leadership among your uh, subordinates, develop their leadership potential. And third is uh, you have to remain focused on what you're doing. And fourth is, you know, uh, as I keep on saying, there will be a lot of unpopular decisions. Let's forget about that. Uh, Forget about the re-election. Forget about getting popular. You have to just simply concentrate on doing what is right for your city or for your locality. Uh, those are the uh, you know those are the programs now, and those are the focus and directions that we are. And third, finally, it's you know you have to make sure that your programs are sustainable. Uh, Hindi peding uh, it's a program that will only appeal to the masses and to become popular. It should be something sustainable. And when it becomes sustainable, you have to make sure that you have all your resources, you have all the funding to support that program. Maraming salamat, Dixon. Maraming thank salamat you, Mayor Benji, for highlighting three things, cost management, leadership at all levels, be ready to make unpopular decisions and remain focused. And uh, finally, you said sustain the initiatives and programs you undertake right now. I was sure it's going to... It's going to Sustain. Thank you, Mayor Benji. We'll go back to you for the next round of questions. Governor Mick, are you still there? Um, yes, I'm here. I'm here. So, sabihin ko sana na pareho lang kay Governor, ay kay Mayor Benji. <laughs> pero baka, baka, pero anyway, ang, ang sa amin lang naman sa experience sa uh, Yolanda, no? uh, it's yung ano lang namin, yung motto namin, people are our greatest resource. You have, we have to keep the damage low and then whatever, kung anong situation ngayon, 
nakikita namin naman natin na ang ang situation ngayon sa Leyte is uh, controlled ang ano managed ang mga ang mga transmissions tuloy-tuloy lang yung no home quarantine policy linisin lang lagi malinis lang lagi ang mga households ng covid so wala tayong problema sa mga business establishments parang ituloy lang natin yan para uh, i think we can survive kasi kung kung magworsen mas magwo-worsen ang situation mas mag pag na stress ang tao na stress din yung lahat apektado lahat pati yung governance maapektuhan panic din ang mga local governments magpapanic ma, ma stress din na natin mga health healthcare workers so for as long as we we continue ang uh, dagdag na rin sa sinabi ni Mayor Benji Kalina yung resources na hindi maubos kaagad na ma-sustain natin i think we can we can survive for for another six months so maraming salamat thank you Thank you, Governor. Make three things. Sabi mo, people are the greatest resources that we have. You know? And uh, we, we have to take good care of our people. And second, keep the damage low. So avoid overstress. And then sustain the resources. So give, just like hey, Mayor Benji, give priority, focus on important things for the pandemic. Uh, thank you, Governor. I'll go back to you later, Governor, for the, another round. The second question is something to do with legislation, and I have asked uh, Vice Mayor Christine to join in the Open Forum. So I'd like to ask uh, Vice Governor, Vice Governor, and then uh, Governor Dax to respond to the second question. Actually, the second question came from Marilita Makatangay uh, of LG Nor Sagaray sa Bulacan. In what effective ways can COVID-19 policies be translated into permanent legislation? Or how can policies be institutionalized to make them sustainable? Is there already a pandemic code crafted by a local government unit? Okay. Let me repeat the question. In what effective ways can COVID-19 policies be translated into permanent legislation? Or how can policies be institutionalized to make them sustainable? Do, we, do you already have pandemic code in your areas, no? in your local government? So can we ask Vice Governor uh, and uh, Governor Dax to respond? Yes, I don't know. Ladies first. Hi. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, Mary Dixon, can you hear me? Yeah, we're listening. Yeah, of course, no? As I am, as I am. Yeah, po. Yes, as I have mentioned, uh, we have uh, passed na the 11 ordinances, which should make it institutionalized. And now, uh, the next thing naman is that we're going to codify it soon para we're collating all the 11 ordinances together. Uh, but it's easier, no? Easier ba maghanap? That's why we're having the uh, codification soon. Hopefully in a month's time, meron na. So, uh, kasi yung sa amin naman, yung ordinances, what we did there are, these are ordinances which are uh, implementable uh, during time of public health emergency. So, it doesn't matter kung anong quarantine status tayo, kung enhanced or modified, as long as we are in a public health emergency, applicable po yung mga ordinances natin. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Vice uh, Governor Christine. You already shared that a while ago about the codification process that you will be going through after uh, you have presented all the ordinances and you are entertaining now of going into the process of codification. All those uh, pandemic-related yeah. ordinances. Yeah, I think that's great. And hopefully we can learn from you how you did it and uh, I'm sure that will really be one of the models that we can share to the rest of the local government units. Uh, Governor Dax? Thank you, Mayor Dixon. And um, I'm very tempted as well to copy the answer of Vice Governor Christie. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, the, the question and the suggestion is, I think, excellent. Na kasi pagka dumadaan tayo sa mga pagsubok, um, this is really an opportunity for us to learn, to innovate, to do better, to institutionalize. So tama siya na dapat magkaroon tayo na 
out of this, kung wala pa tayong code ngayon, uh, this, this can be a very important discussion in ULAP, Christine, di ba? Uh, with Karen there and uh, yourself and Gov Vice Gov Kimpo, we can talk about this, how we can have uh, somewhat of a recommendation to LGUs um, to institutionalize policies. Pero I would assume then, Dixon, na sa tingin ko, bawat LGU, naging iba rin yung journey through this pandemic. Naging iba yung karanasan. Um, there are some guiding principles. We conserve your resources, prioritize well, think on your feet, communicate well to your people, make sure that you have a feedback mechanism para malalaman mo, makaka-adjust ka kung, kung may mali ka bang nagagawa or you, if there are things that you can do better. Uh, and open communications with your peers. Use the leagues. Talk to your vice governor's league, talk to your governor's league, talk to your mayor's league. Makakakuha ka doon ng maraming ano eh, uh, best practice na kukopyahin mo na lang. Uh, yung mga mobile palengke, yung mga ganyan, kopya-kopyahan lang naman din kami. So I think wala naman masama. Uh, maganda nga yung nagkukopyahan. But, but yes, definitely 100% I agree with the dapat magkaroon ng codification. Not really to to set the the actions that have to be done. Misa kasi masyado tayong madetalye pag nag pag nag set ng policy even in executive orders. Hindi dapat idetalye lahat ng ano. There has to be room for elbow room for LGUs to to innovate, to be creative and to find newer solutions. So thank you for the question. Yeah. Thank you uh Gobdax and thank you for uh, saying it that ULAP can steer the wheel for doing the legislative action at the local level. Thank you. And as you've said, uh, but all codification processes must be relevant, contextualized, and as much as possible, it should be innovative uh, to fit on the context of every local government unit. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Governor Dax. And for the third question, I'd like to ask Mayor Love and Governor Kaka. I hope you're still there because the, it has something to do with funding. Um, Yes. Uh, what can you suggest or recommend to poor local government units with very limited human logistical resources and local funds and struggling in the battle against COVID-19 pandemic? And um, the other question here is how to generate resources in this period of pandemic. But uh, the first part, first question is about for local government units with very limited resources, what do you recommend? What do you suggest? Maybe we can ask uh, Governor Kaka and uh, Mayor Love to respond to the question. Governor Kaka? Okay. Uh, okay. Um, first of all, I, I, I think I'll uh, take the question uh, first. I, ah, okay. Mayor, okay, let me go now. Ah, sige, si Mayor Love na lang. Mayor Love. Mauna muna si Mayor, sige. Oh, is it okay with you, Governor Kaka? Okay oh, lang. Mayor muna, Mayor. Na it's fine, it's fine. Gov, you can, you can proceed. Po, we already started. It's fine. Okay, sige. Gov, please. Uh, sorry, Mayor. Okay, sa so, uh, question about uh, with provinces na medyo limited yung resources, kung natingin ko, uh, naging malaki rin tulong yung uh, binigay ng national government no, na suporta sa mga LGUs. But I think one strategy could also be the sharing of resources among gov gov uh, government LGUs in a territory, like let's say in a region. No? Like uh, as what has uh, been experienced in Caraga, uh, we uh, established the one Caraga Shield. And even the protection of our uh, regional borders, our contributions coming from the different provinces that uh, we support to the law enforcement agencies. The same thing with the exchanges in our uh, produce. No? So because we have very limited uh, access to markets outside the region, so mabilis din yung usapan about uh, yung uh, pagpapalit ng mga produkto kasi medyo malapit lang. So kahit na siguro hindi uh, in process yung mga produkto, pwede agad makipagpalitan sa kabilang probinsya o kahit sa probinsya na sa Leyte, halimbawa no, na nagpalitan kami ng watermelon at na ibang goods doon uh, papunta sa Ginagat Island. So, pwede magkaroon ng ganyang collaboration para maibsan. Malaking bahagi din yung exchanges among municipalities kasi 
sa mga munisipyo sa dinagat na nagpo-produce ng bigas uh, at sa kabilang uh, munisipyo na mas malakas ang isda, uh, meron agad silang parang yung nagiging venue, yung parang tabo sa Kapitolyo na nakakaroon sa lang venue para magpalitan ng resources. Uh, in fact, kahit sa tingin ko, pinakamahalaga din na posibleng uh, bigyan ng pansin ng mga LGU. So yung, kasi ngayon, halimbawa sa Mindanao, yung pinakamalapit na namin RT-PCR ay Davao. Sa so isang posible rin ay magkaroon ng agreement ang mga LGU na instead of kanya-kanyang diskarte sa pagsiset up ng uh, RT-PCR, pwede rin na isa lang, no? Uh, Nitutulak namin na bigyan ng kapasidad ng butuan or ang Surigao City, halimbawa, para yung hospital na yan ay maging testing center para sa lahat. Um, uh, saan din pwede uh, kumuha ng iba't iba pang mga sources of revenue. Tingin ko mahalaga din yung na account, yung contribution ng mga tao mismo. Uh, halimbawa ngayon, dahil nga hindi makalabas yung produkto namin, yung mga local namin na uh, may isda ay maraming na, ma, nahatid na isda sa palengke. So kailangan lang siguraduhin na ma-regulate yung uh, tamang presyo at kahit sila no, nagpo-contribute hindi mo kailangan ng maraming pera, tingin ko eh. Pero kailangan mo ng mas maraming pagkakaintindihan sa kabuuan ng iyong teritoryo kung saan ka na mumuno. Tingin ko yun yung susi. Uh, more than, kasi pwede naman talaga marami kang pera, pero kung hindi natin siya alam paano gagamitin, baka hindi rin maging efektibo yung sagot. Pero kung gawin natin talaga yung lahat ng mga maya na bahagi ng Uh, pag i ng local government at uh, sila mismo ay bahagi even sa pag-raise ng funds at pagpapatakbo ng mga MCCCs at pagsiguro na may mga ay may tamang information ang kanilang mga komunidad nang wala nang uh, yung sila mismo nang iisip kung paano siya gagawin di pwede mo siyang i-account at magiging malaking malaking economic uh, contribution niya ng isang barangay o ng isang people's organization na nag nagpatakbo ng ganyang mga programa sa kanilang lokalidad. Think mo yung ganyang klaseng innovation ay nangyayari ngayon kahit saan naman sa lahat ng mga probinsya, syudad at munisipyo para ma-address yung COVID-19. Thank you, Governor Gaka, and uh, thank you for sharing about the need for interlocal cooperation among LGUs as you practice that in Dinagat. And then, of course, the community contribution, the, the asset-based community development approach, you know, the point in the time much survive using the local economy right now. And uh, as you've said, we just have to be innovative um, this time of the pandemic. Salamat po, uh, Governor Kaka. Uh, Mayor Love? Uh, thank you, thank you. Sa akin naman, uh, siguro for our LGU, considering that we have very limited resources in terms of our like uh, era uh, on how we can support our management for COVID cases, para sa akin first is trans being transparent. Because uh, transparency drives our, cons drives our constituents to be generous. Uh, mm -hmm. When 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 uh, the pandemic started, we received like 200,000 worth of thermal scanners, so many PPEs coming from alang 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 alanganon so are already staying in Canada, in America, and we received a lot of uh, financial and uh, in goods na mga donations here in our town, and at the same time outsourcing. Uh, I am so thankful that uh, we have a very supportive governor. Kung for example, na wawalan na kami ng Uh, rapid test kits when we were starting, uh, VTMs na kulang na, isang tawag lang sa governor namin kasi he is very supportive na bibigyan din kami. And at the same time, very prompt action. For example, ngayon, uh, naka-receive kami ng letter na yung DBM will be releasing the LGSF. So deadline, October 31 pa, but we already submitted ahead of time. Upon release, diretsyo submit para at least ma-process agad yung request namin. And then, uh, sabi ko na, our outsourcing. As of now, we receive donations na coming from a barangay from Makati, nagbigay na ng mga financial assistance to our LGUs, and many other goods coming from NGOs, mga PPE, PPEs, and so many other things because of ano, uh, parang ma ma networking and outsourcing. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Love. Uh, I like what you said, transparency will lead to generosity. You were able to generate a lot of resources because the, pe the public, the people are aware of what's going on and the limited capacity of the LGU by 
by providing them the information, it will produce something positive coming from the community. And uh, you said, be prompt and proactive, especially with the Bayanihan too, no? Kasi ngayon, hindi na siya automatic. You, you just have to, kung sino yung maunang mag, mag submit. And uh, the networking and the outsourcing could really be the key for those local yeah. government units with uh, limited uh, resources. Thank you, Mayor Lab. I'll go back to you to the next round po, ha? Sige, ang pang-apat na tanong, we have something to do with opening the economy. Uh, maybe we can ask Mayor Benji and Vice Governor Christine to uh, make a response of uh, uh, this question. Ang tanong lang po, in line with the new normal, this is coming from Ms. Jennifer Camillon, the Associate Project Officer of the Development Academy of the Philippines. In line with the new normal, how can you prepare for the opening of the municipality or province for tourists? And I think, uh, although Mayor Benji already explained, but maybe we, in, the, in, a, in, in briefly lang, uh, could share the, the response of this question. Maybe we can start with uh, Mayor Benji. Okay, thank you, Paul uh, Dixon. Uh, first, if we follow the three S's and one R, uh, we have to open up surely, slowly, safely, and responsibly. And that's the reason why uh, we did not immediately open up and let everyone come in. Uh, what we did was to, you know, uh, limit the number of, uh, let us say, for tourists, limit the number of tourists to just 200 so that we will learn from it, experience it. Uh, it's a learning curve for everyone. Once we are uh, confident, you know, confidence level, level number is elevated, high, then we can say that uh, we're open to the other uh, provinces and they can come in or to the other regions and they can come in. And at the same time, we'll be able to learn how to manage big number of tourists under the new normal. The same manner, same thing with our economy. You know? What we did was to slowly open up our economy so that once we, uh, you know, it's a hammer and dance concept. Once we feel something wrong, something, uh, you know, when our cases, uh, there's a surge in the number of cases, then we pull back. We can easily pull back. Hindi yung open up kagad. Sige, labas na lahat kayo mga tao. Then it's so difficult for you to be able to pull back. You know? So slowly, surely, safely, and responsibly. Thank you, Papa. Wow. And that opens surely, slowly, safely, and responsibly. The buggy way. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor uh, Benji. Um, Vice Governor Christine? Uh, yes, I'm here. Yes, Vice. Yes, I'm here. Um, yeah, I know. Yon, tama yon. Safe, um, slowly, nga, slowly. We cannot just open it without uh, regulations. So that's why uh, we are also uh, assisting with the. Uh, Department of Tourism, like hindi lang po dapat or kinaka, hindi lang dapat na ordinansa lang namin. But also, if, of course, if everybody follows the ordinances, ordinances, okay na sana. But yet, we know na yung mga tourism establishments are also having their own new guidelines for the new normal. So, uh, we come together with our ordinances and as well as yung mga kinakailangan for the, the tourism establishments. I think we can open up. But again, no, slowly lang. Kasi right now, uh, there's so many establishments who are opening up. But yet, alam mo naman, yung mga tao, ayaw pa rin gumala. Ayaw pa rin pumunta sa mga tourism establishments. They're also fear for their own health. Eh. So, ang hirap pa rin. We're trying to open up. We're opening up. But yet, wala pa rin mga guests pumupunta sa mga tourism establishments natin. And they cannot live with uh, kung ilan-ilan lang yung pumupunta sa so it's hard it's hard but hopefully no hopefully um maybe hopefully six months one year will be open now thank you fully yeah salamat po vice governor christine no um you were highlighting on the regulatory function of government so mga tourist destinations as you said legislation is the key and the enforcement of this policy my suggestion to see adele uh Evangel, ang suggestion po niya, the LGUs may consider certifying tourist sites a safe site from COVID-19 or hygienic site. Monitoring the sites will be the responsibility of tourist, a tourism officer of cities and municipalities. This may be done daily, the responsibility for making sure the tourist sites are safe, safe sites, uh, uh, respective owners or tourist spots managers then have this information published in Facebook using GIS so the tourists can 
access this input daily to give them confidence to visit the sites. I think uh, yun din ang explanation ni uh, Vice Governor uh, Christine. Thank you, uh, Vice Governor Christine and Mayor Benji. For the fifth question, I'd like to ask the two governors, Governor Mick and Governor Dax. Uh, this has something to do with political boundaries and supervisory function. Since cities have a separate power and jurisdiction, how can a province implement an effective solution to avoid surge of cases while these cities are within the geographical reach of the province? Um, yeah, w would you like to respond, uh, Vice Governor Dax and Governor um, Mick? Ang, ang tanong po is, uh, since cities have a separate power and jurisdiction, how can a province implement an effective solution to avoid surge of cases while these cities are within the geographical reach of the province, especially yung mga highly urbanized cities. They are independent, so they are not under the jurisdiction of the province. And how to do the synergy uh, between these highly urbanized cities and the provincial government? Yes, uh, uh, ano, parang, uh, I think tama yun, referring to the, the independent cities ano, na hindi under sa jurisdiction. So, Ang ano naman namin dito na uh, actually we had a meeting with the with the mayor ng uh, Tacloban City. Uh, it was a very pleasant meeting, magandang kinalabasan. Uh, it led to the reduction actually ng cases. No, it led to the re reduction of cases kasi parang ano eh, parang we were talking about ano ba mag maglalagay ba tayo ng mga mga checkpoints, i-ano ba natin, parang ganoon. Pero Kasi marami, marami sa amin nagtatrabaho doon uh, at saka marami rin sa, doon sa city na nagtatrabaho din dito sa amin. Parang talagang everyday yan, heavy ang ano yan. No? Uh, despite, na, despite sa political divide namin, we really have to talk and nangyari naman yon So uh, I hope na tuloy-tuloy na ang trends na nakikita natin sa mga numbers. Uh, we see more improvements sa numbers after the discussion. Kasi na-discuss naman natin ang mga important things na agrihan naman ang mga important things. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Governor Mick. Thank you for that. No? Uh, Governor Dax? Uh, yeah. Um, si Gov Mick uh, said it very well. This time, this situation, this pandemic calls for bayanihan. Uh, anybody who plays politics at this time will surely get the uh, little raised eyebrows from the people, di ba? So, uh, alam natin yan, sensitive naman tayo, na unawaan natin. Wala muna ng politika, usapang matino, usapang totoo, how do we work together to serve the very same people that, uh, that have put us here. So, yeah. Uh, sa amin, in our case, wala naman kasi kaming city na, na within our jurisdiction, although there is a nearby uh, city, a major big city, na, that's where most financial transactions are done and that's where a lot of uh, the nearby towns of our province go to get employment. Kaya yung, yung movement be between that border is, uh, is very much uh, monitored. Yun ang ginagawa namin. So lista, work permit, permit kay mayor to uh, good for one week or two weeks para renew ka lang ng renew para namo-monitor namin kung sino ang regularly lumalabas, sino regularly pumapasok. Uh, the same na yung mga taga-city sa labas that work here, ganun din. So may work permits, arrangements kami na, na nakukuha yung data and then we mine that data. And we see how do we make it more efficient. Yeah. So ganun lang po. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Doc. Salamat po. Salamat po. And uh, for Mayor Love and Governor Kaka, um, this is something to do with the local bureaucracy. Does the local government unit provide any type of assistance or support to their employees with COVID-19? What special assistance do you give if your employees are infected with COVID-19? Um, Mayor Love? Uh so far, we haven't, uh, because we haven't experienced yet an employee being infected with COVID-19. So we can't release, as of the moment, we haven't re released any assistance. But uh, 
for example, for our fl frontliners, we already gave uh, most especially to our job order employees who are really, like for example, the one in charge in transporting the LSIs, uh, who are really risking their health like for the cleaning of our temporary treatment and monitoring facility. I issued an executive order wherein they will be given additional incentive aside from their uh, salary. And at the same time, we released 5,000 financial assistance to all uh, who are uh, acting or who are in, on the front now for our COVID-19 response. But for our regular employees, most especially our nurses, I already wrote a letter to DBM about this because it is subject to PS and we can't release any fund for that. Thank you, Mayor Love, for taking good care of your uh, frontliners. Yes. Mayor Love, may the dagdag. Yes. But also, I would like to share because we received a, a donation. Yeah. Ah, yes, yes. Because we received also a donation from L'Oreal Philippines wherein they have given nurses. Wherein, in that little way, know that we made our nurses and our front end, uh, no, they, we, we provide. Are you okay, Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Love. Thank you. Uh, Governor Kaka? Oh, tingin ko, uh, komo naman to sa lahat ng mga uh, LGU uh, uh, provincia man o syudad o munisipyo. Uh, tingin ko komo yung hazard pay. Tingin ko komo yung uh, support uh, PPE provisions to frontliners. Uh, tingin ko Common din yung uh, providing uh, food uh, support to all checkpoints, to all operators of their uh, quarantine facilities at hospital. Uh, Tingko yun yung common. At siguro sa dinagat lang uh, dito sa amin, sa Kapitolyo, um, malaki yung uh, pag-aalaga namin sa mga taga-Kapitolyo halimbawa na kailangan lumabas sa dinagat para magpa-hospital, dumalaw sa uh, mag-attend to very important transactions. Marami pa rin kami transactions na kailangan namin gawin sa Solidaw City. Uh, at dahil nga kami ay wala namang formal hospital, yung, uh, even, yung infirmary level yung aming tatlong district hospital. So uh, may mga cases na kailangan din namin dalhin sa Solidaw. So kapag ka, uh, mer although meron kami programa para sa lahat ng aming mga mayan, para meron din kami special care para sa aming mga uh, empleyado. Yan din ang isang dahilan kung bakit meron kami provincial care and containment center dahil strict kami sa quarantine protocols. Um, hiwalay sila sa mga munisipyo. Una para hindi maging burden sa municipalities yung care and containment ng mga provincial employees. So meron kami sariling facility uh, para sa aming mga empleyado. Kasama na rin dyan yung pag-aalaga sa kanilang pamilya kapag ka wala dito yung uh, kanilang parent no uh, kung sila ay binigyan ng assignment o official na trabaho na lalabas ng United Islands yung mga kapitolyo rin nagkakaroon ng priority sa uh, ilang mga access uh, to uh, certain goods no yung sobra halimbawa sa tabo namin uh, binibili ng kapitolyo at ang unang babahaginan ay yung mga empleyado sa Kapitolyo na may mga pamilyang malalaki hanggang sa yung single, uh, pati yung pagkain para sa amin, uh, PCCC. Uh, yung mga iba din na uh, mga empleyado ng uh, local governments, parang meron din subsidy yung uh, provincial government para sa mga frontliners, uh, dun sa mga pagkain, uh, binibili rin namin yung local harvest para din i-distribute pabalik sa mga munisipyo. Uh, at ang priority din nga na nagiging beneficiary bukod dun sa mga sectors. Meron kaming listahan ng mga uh, artisanal fisher folks, uh, listahan ng mga uh, medyo mahihirap na mga maghasaka, at saka listahan ng mga empleyado sa munisipyo. Uh, may, meron din silang priority sa 
kapag ka nagbabahagi na ng resources uh, mula sa subsidy na binibigay ng provincial government. So tingin ko uh, it, itong mga ganito yung uh, nakakatawid din sa uh, kalagayan ngayon ng mga empleyado natin sa gobyerno. Salamat, salamat Governor uh, Kaka. No? Um, yeah, it's already 4.13 and we're supposed to end at 4.30. All online discussions should that go beyond three to four hours. So that's the advice of experts. No? Maybe before I do my synthesis, I will invite you for a 15 second of laughter. You know, children laugh between 300 to 400 times a day. Adults like us, we laugh only seven to eight times a day. The reason why? Because we laugh to the mind. We should laugh to the body. Just laugh. Laughter is a gift from God. For 15 seconds, if you cannot laugh, sorry, you are not a normal human being. I want you to laugh in 15 seconds. One, two, ready, go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let me do the simple synthesis of, uh, uh, of the discussions. By the way, um, may I ask uh, all the resource persons if uh, you are willing to uh, share information. Uh, there are a lot of questions here, Pa, and then my mga comments, uh, if they can keep in touch with you because you want to learn from your local government unit and your, all your presentations were very informative and worthy for emulation also. So may we ask you if you are willing, kasi ma, yung mga participants natin dito, they can keep in touch with your office, no? If they want to seek some information, how you're doing it. May tanong pa nga dito about sa Taal Volcano. So this can be answered. Maybe many of you, all of you can respond how we will deal upang mag, mag erupt ang Taal Volcano. Sige. Sige. So let me do my uh, synthesis. Um, yeah. To end our, uh, uh, for this, for my part, no? Um, um, Mitch, can you see it? Can you uh, see this, the screen, the, my slide? Mitch? Yes, sir. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, lessons learned uh, from our resource person, from the five resource person and, uh, and uh, one reactor. It was a really inspiring afternoon, no? despite all the challenges we're facing. Like, I suppose there are four areas that share this afternoon. Una yung convergence. Na, malinaw sa sharing ni uh, Governor Dax, no, yung building, building strategy, yung national agencies, uh, private sector, MLGU, kay Mayor, uh, May, uh, Mayor Lab naman, yung convergence ng divine world, uh, province at saka sa LNP, uh, yung late manifested by uh, Governor Mick ang kanyang leadership, no? trying to synergize uh, the whole province. Ang dinagat naman all local leaders from different political party, no? parties. No? So maganda yung sinabi ni, ni Governor Kaka. And of course, si, um, si Baguio City, Mayor Benji, yung partnership niya with uh, technical experts. Uh, remember, he was talking about the AI technology coming from uh, Japan. And so yung partnership na on technology side. No? So the convergence, what we... What we hear this afternoon, yung national and local governments, no, Malinao, and then the different layers of local government, the province, the cities, the municipalities, and the barangay. And of course, the three sectors, the government, the private sector, and the CSO. That was very obvious in all the sharing. The convergence is the key. The other one is communication, um, the use of science. Kirino said, see, Governor Dax, use of GIS as I support mechanism for decision making. And uh, si Leite naman, very conscious si Governor Mick sa uh, data. No? And uh, I think the whole time he was discussing, it was all about the numbers. And that was so wonderful. Um, he even talked about the positivity rate, uh, including yung mga frontliners. And uh, sa alang-alang, kay okay, Mayor Love, yung transparency uh, sa COVID-19 uh, plans and expenditure, letting the public know. And sa Baguio yung uh, all technologies, all technologies converging, all te use all the possible digital technology to uh, communicate horizontally and, uh, and uh, vertically. Ang kay Governor Kakaya naman, thank you for always uh, raising the point of always 
remind ourselves that in all forms of communicating our strategy, the center should be the human being. Thank you for that, uh, Governor Kakao. And the other uh, C is the capacity. And the capacity talks about learning acceleration. We have to learn fast. In this pandemic, the, the, the thing that we should do is learn fast. And uh, sabi ni Governor Benji, you know, we're using technology. Um, if you cannot adapt to the digital technology, we'll be overtaken. And uh, in fact, practically almost all operations, yung cashless, contactless uh, operations, the city government, that's a, that's a big wow. No? And of course, more than that, it's a caring service. Uh, we, we don't want just only to provide the technology, but we, we have to extend some care. No? Um, like ang kay Governor Petilia, yung training, you know, investment on uh, training. Uh, si Mayor Love, yung sa RHU, no? priority talaga niya. Yung Dinagat uh, Island kay Governor Kaka, uh, sabi po niya yung asset-based uh, asset based community development, looking into the, the capacity of the LGU, maski yung uh, it's, it's a fourth plus uh, province, if I'm not mistaken, or fifth plus, and we're saying, yeah, we can still survive. Uh, we have assets inside. Uh, we, we look inside more than looking outside. We look inside the capacity of the local government unit. And of course, yung functional regulation. Um, si Baguio City, no, yung disciplined city, the, the people should, must cooperate. And thank you, Mayor Benji, for sharing that, no, yung discipline talaga ng community, even the cleanliness of uh, the, the market. And But your most important contribution, uh, Mayor Benji, yung uh, contact tracing uh, uh, strategy or ecosystem. And uh, I, I think all over the country, they are, they are using uh, your technology, uh, Mayor Benji. And then, oh. Indition is shared. Am I still connected, uh, Mitch? Can you still hear me? Yes, sir. You're still connected, Paul. Sorry, nag hang yung laptop. But the third is about the community, which is the fourth C, no? From convergence, capacity, commun uh, communication, and community. The, for the community, there's something so beautiful. Uh, Governor Petilia said uh, the Litenios, because of the many experiences of disaster, they're very resilient. And yung framing ng mga tao, from victims to survivors, from despair to hope, from bleeding to healing. Wow, that's really beautiful. And for the Dinaga, how Governor Kaka engage the community, uh, yung, yung community trying to help one another. Yung kay Governor Dax, wow, that's another wow. Yung mga neighbors, if the pag hindi qualified for home quarantine, the neighbors and the relatives would, would offer their place. No, uh, I think that's, uh, that's very, very inspiring. And then sabi ni Mayor Lab na uh, the only way we can be more in, we, we can we can generate more resources and ensure the public will uh, really be will, will participate. And philosophy niya engage the community using digital platforms. So yung Facebook, no? Sabi po niyan kanina. And of course, si Mayor uh, Benji yung uh, what he was sharing about the sectoral engagement. In fact, my sectoral testing pero sabi niya. Talk to the sector, engage the sector, so uh, talagang segmented, no? tina, tina, tina target per sector. And thank you also, Mayor Benjik, for uh, sharing the idea of survival garden. I think that was uh, something that uh, worth emulating also, the survival garden. I think this is all Mitch, uh, the lessons that I got. Sorry the my computer naghang po siya. Thank you, Mitch. Okay, sir. Maraming maraming salamat po. We'll just probably get a copy of the last uh, the slide shared by Mayor Dixon. We'll also share that slide. Thank you so much po, Mayor Dixon. And maraming maraming salamat po sa ating mga speakers. I'm sure I speak on behalf or participants. Ang dami po nating natutunan, ang dami nating napulot at uh, probably marami din tayo yung dapat pang pag-isipan. Ano po? And uh, we also got a taste of the laughter yoga, something Dr. Dixon always does uh, I mean, mga trainings sa CLRG, that's something we also miss. And, uh, well, laughter, something we can all use ngayon distressing times na to. But this uh, webinar really inspired us hearing how our LGUs are able to meet head-on the challenges uh, brought about by this pandemic. So again, maraming salamat po. And uh, we'll now proceed with the last part 
of our webinar will be uh, sharing with you the certificates um, we will be giving to our uh, resource persons, to our reactor, to our moderator, and of course to our partner. So let me just read to you uh, the citation. Uh, UPN CPAG Center for Local and Regional Governance awards this certificate of appreciation to Major, Mayor Benjamin Magalong, City of Baguio, for sharing his invaluable knowledge as resource person during the webinar titled Rising to the Challenge of the Pandemic, LGU Best Practices in COVID-19 Management Second Edition, held on October 8, 2020 via Zoom Cloud Meetings, given this 8th day of October 2020 at Quezon City. Signed, Alicia B. Celestino, CLRG Director, and Dan A. Sagil, NC PAG Dean. And uh, the same certificate po is awarded to Mayor Lovell and uh, to Governor Kabagao, to Governor Dominic Petilia, to Governor Dakila Kua, um, to Vice Governor Christine Garin, our reactor, maraming salamat ma'am. And of course, to our moderator, Dr. Ditsan Yasai. And finally, uh, we also give the certificate of appreciation to our partner for this webinar at the League of Vice Governors of the Philippines. Maraming maraming salamat po. And now to officially close our program, may I call on the director of CLRG and CPAG Associate Professor Alicia Celestino for her closing remarks, ma'am. Okay, thank you so much, Michelle. We have indeed a very fruitful and enjoyable afternoon, but uh, this has come to end. And I would like to first um, let me thank our esteemed governors and mayors who shared their time and talent to be with us this afternoon. So maraming salamat po kay Mayor Benjamin Magalong of Baguio, Mayor Love uh, Anyu of Alang Alang, to uh, Governor Arlene Bagao, to Governor uh, Leopoldo Petilia, and to Governor Dakila Carlo Cua. Maraming maraming salamat po. Your experiences in fighting the pandemic are really inspiring, and most of these are being replicated nationwide. Thank you po for showing the way to the rest of the uh, LGUs. Our gratitude also goes to our partner institution, the League of Vice Governors of the Philippines, and our reactor, Vice Governor Garin, for your helpful comments and the additional information of what Iloilo is doing concerning the fight against uh, the virus. And of course, our longtime friend, si Mayor Yasai, for ably moderating this afternoon's event and the hearty laughter that you did. I'd like to think that I'm still normal because I laughed with you twice. Okay. It really brings us great joy and pride to discover that we have a good number of local government units who courageously rose up to the challenge of an unprecedented pandemic. Everybody was caught flat-footed by the sudden emergence of a vicious pandemic and there was no recourse back then but to lock down the whole country. The normal things that we used to do in our daily lives came to an abrupt halt for almost half a year. Amidst uncertainty, local authorities had no choice but to courageously stand up and face the invisible enemy heads on. Local governments like our sharers for today quickly instituted multifarious innovative initiatives to keep their constituents at least afloat while the national government was figuring out how to effectively deal with this enemy. Our vigilant local governments have to assure their terrified people that they are there for them, that they are committed to keep them out of harm's way in a number of ways like strictly enforcing health protocols, border controls, uh, open communication, carefully handling the repatri repatriation of locally stranded individuals, establishment of quarantine facilities, aggressive contact tracing, use of digi uh, digital technology to promote contactless transactions, and even the observance of good governance amidst a vicious crisis, and so on. Moreover, our LGUs consciously endeavored to bring a sense of security amidst all the threats posed by the pandemic. 
economically, the LGUs tried to balance the need to earn a living and the need to protect the people from the COVID-19 virus. Opening up the local economy was done slowly but carefully so as not to cause more harm than good. Based on the presentations, I have also seen that our LGUs have shown their awesome management skills in orchestrating all efforts in fighting an unseen enemy. The whole of community, including the barangay health workers, farmers, fishermen, non-government organizations, and so on, were put on board. This goes to show that unity amidst diversity can still be done, especially when human survival is at risk. The Filipino spirit of Bayanihan is being demonstrated more now than ever before. The experiences of our local government sharers for today only proves one thing, that local autonomy under a decentralized setting is alive and well. It has actually engendered innovativeness on the part of our local government officials. It's not that we welcome this pandemic, but this health crisis has sort of pushed our local government officials and their partners to be more inventive, to be more logical, less political, and more reliant on science in decision-making, and more forward-looking. That is, anticipating the worst scenarios that could still happen. These are marks of progressive leadership. And this is what we need in all levels of government. To end my message, again, I would like to extend my congratulations to our guests, our sharers. You make your constituents and the, Fili and the Filipino nation proud of you. So carry on. We wish you all the best. Thank you then sa lahat ng participants from all over the country. I hope that you continue to watch our upcoming webinars. To the CLRG team, again, maraming salamat for a job well done. God bless us all.